Welcome back to Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for the biggest podcast of the year, the Tour de France 2023 preview. I'm excited. We've got a week until the race, actually less than that. It starts this Saturday. We're recording Monday uh, late afternoon. We've got most of the team announcements. EF, I'm sorry, we're not waiting. We've got all the big teams. <laughs> What are, I'm excited, Benji, and, and especially after the, the National Championships weekend where Pogacar won both the, the TT and the road race. And, I mean, you draw conclusions you want from that, but the Tour is in a more exciting position today than it was the night of Liège, Bastogne Liège. Certainly. I'm not sure how visible that Slovenian country flag is going to be on the jersey of UAE of Pogacar, but that being said... Also, it's lovely to see that Eskiel Moser, for example, will be riding in the Danish jersey. That will see quite a bit of riders at the Tour de France International jersey. But I'm also looking forward to it because we've got that duel. We've got that fight. We've got Vingegaard versus Pogacar. Last year, we had one of the best editions of the Tour de France I had seen in my lifetime. With a rather uneventful start, maybe, at the Grand Depart in Denmark, I'd say. But it really built up from that, where Pogacar displayed dominance in the first two weeks. And then Granon was the real turnover. Granon was, was where Yumbo put their fist on the table and said, this is ours now. And from that point on, Vingegaard was able to withstand any attacks by Pogacar. And that's how the Tour de France 2022 was done. But 2023, whew, parkour. We'll talk about it, eh? Exactly. So this is how we're going to structure it. As you know, we'll do a quick route overview and then we'll get into the top favorites and teams like we always do before talking about some of the sprinters as well and that precedes our stage by stage detailed analysis which with picks for each stage and analysis of the parkour based on the start list we now have and then of course we'll do our KOM white jersey green jersey and yellow jersey predictions so as Benji said that the Grand Depart this year is different to last year last year the bridge was a bit of a flop um <laughs> I don't know how they, they engineered bridges are quite they don't bend and yeah it was but this one was a bit of a flop whereas we have the Grand Depart in the Basque country with an extremely difficult opening stage and then frankly a first week which is the most difficult I think we've covered Benji with the Tourmalet with the Pleated Dome back in a uh, mountaintop finish on stage nine which I consider more selective than Super Planche de Belfia certainly than Chateau d'Aigle last year there is no cobbled stage but it's just a difficult even Marie Blanc is kind of the Laurent stage of stage nine of 2020 is hemmed in there before the Tourmalet so very very difficult first week how do you see the second week to be honest I don't see it getting much easier certainly there is opportunities for sprinters though there's opportunities for breakaways and transitioning stages but it does build up again after having those Pyrenees like you mentioned in that first week it goes to the Alps and so forth Grand Colombier Ramache Chouplan which uh, kind of reminds me from that stage that Marc Padun won in the Dauphiné for example then saint gervais Mont Blanc also a mountain finish once again, a bit more Pogacar style will go in-depth a bit later, but week three has a time trial, and we haven't spoken about a single time trial so far, so is the time trial kilometers going to be notable? I think so, because it's effectively a 30-33 kilometer time trial in terms of okay. time, because of how difficult it is. I mean, it's still going to be in over half an hour there on the TT bike, but it is not. There were more TTKs in the Dauphiné, which was a one-week race, so, you know... Make of it what you will. Do you, do I think the TT will decide GC? Not really. Uh, yeah. Because say they had an extra 20, a prologue that was flat, another or even a 15K flat one. Do I think that would really decide GC? Like when I look at, I think someone like Yates, who's a fringe third place contender, he's hurt because he's better than O'Connor and Hinley in the TT. But for Pagatra and Vinga, honestly, the TT to me is a bit of a wash. In good weather, uh, in wet weather, pog, in bad weather, uh, yeah. no. Anyway, they, they, <laughs> they, they can, they're like 50 50 in TTs. And yeah. yeah, then that precedes stage 17. So there's like five GC days in a row uh, with the rest day splitting it apart. The Col de Lolo stage, we spoke about this yesterday, Benji. One of the most difficult stages in the Tour de France in the last 10 ever, really. It's like up there, it's a really, really hard stage, especially a 21st century stage with 5,000 Denevelle and the Courchevel finish. And that's actually two transition stages, and then we're sort of we have a an Alsace uh, little replication that they tried in the Tour de France Femme, and then then we're away in Paris. So it's yeah, something for everybody. I would say there's not many apart from the Basque Country. There is not really many 
puncher finishes. This isn't the Vuelta. So that's what it's missing. I don't think that's a bad thing either. I don't watch the Tour de France to see four stages like that either. Um, I'll fight back. Oh, yeah? I think punchers need to adapt. I think there are stages on this parkour that look like breakaway stage where punchers can win from being in the breakaway. We'll go more in depth into those in a second, but maybe you disagree with me once we get to those stages. But I feel like that's my counterpoint to that aspect. The Grand Depart, I think, will be selective. I think we have three, we have a potentially a GC stage, a, a very reduced sprint stage, and then a proper sprint stage as we get into French Basque Country. And so there will be action there. Those stages will be worth watching. And yeah, there's, I think, the sprinters as well. The teams that haven't brought a pure sprinter here, and most of them have, um, you... There's so many opportunities for them, and that's why we'll get into FDJ team discussion as well. <laughs> uh, but before we get into the, the big teams uh, and the defending champions and UAE as well, I'll mention this show is supported by you. As you know, Benji and Luke, or maybe you don't know, Benji, Luke, and the whole crew are coming to Andorra uh, this week, and we're going to be doing the first week of the Tour de France uh, together. And just like we did in the Giro, and we m maybe we'll try to do the whole of Welter together as well and go to Barcelona in person for the, uh, the Grand Depart there in Spanish. But yeah, they're coming. We're going to be doing live streams uh, for stages one and, and I think one, two, five, six provisionally and nine. But make sure you follow L LRCP Twitter for that info. That'll be on the YouTube channel of LRCP as well. So make sure you subscribe to that channel if you want to see our live stream watch alongs for maybe the last hour, hour and a half of select stages we think will be exciting. We picked Foss on Brony in the Giro, and actually it was one of the better stages, so <laughs> we're off to a good start uh, with those. And if you want to support the podcast so we can keep doing cool things like that, you can donate to us through our Ko-Fi link down below, buy us a cup of coffee, or indeed help us out with trips uh, to go to the races or the crew coming here so we can podcast in person or just keep it going because at the moment it's it's tough a tough market out there advertising wise uh but we love the podcast we love your support if you do want to support the show uh there's a link down below to directly support us at ko-fi.com slash lantern rouge cycling podcast with that out of the way benji jumbo visma they announced <laughs> it this morning with the sort of ai they like the ai announcements uh, their team, Kelderman, Koos, Van Hooydonk, Laporte, Benoit, Van Aert, Van Bala, and the defending champ, Jonas Vingegaard. What do you make of this team with Kreuzweig out after the crash in the Dauphin and Kelderman in? I don't think that specific difference really moves an eel for me. Kreuzweig out, Kelderman in. I was kind of on the page of Kelderman should have been in in the first place already before that crash happened. It's still unfortunate for Kreuzweig though, but looking at this team, there's a majestic difference from last year, and that's the fact that on paper, they have only one leader. That's Fingaga. I know that our producer Luke would say that Kellerman's a co-leader here, but I don't see that happening. I think he's going to be domestique in this team for Jonas. Dude, Luke's ideal teams are Olaf Koy with Van Aert leading him out, <laughs> and then <laughs> Arvid Decline as backup sprinter. <laughs> he can't defend himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Anyway, the Jumbo team next to Jonas Fingaga. Mountain support, you've got the likes of Sepp Gus, so he's doing the Giro Tour double. And we've also got, next to him, Wilco Kellerman, like we said, Van Aert there, who seems to say he doesn't want to go for the green jersey this year, so that might change his activities in the race a tiny bit. But outside of that, it feels like they've got more the riders you'd expect in a, a couple season. Van Hoydonk, Laporte, Knoots, and Van Baale. <laughs> Are you surprised by that, knowing that last year the couple stage was there? This year, no. Do you think that Van Aert is basically a mountain domestique now? I think so. I think he that's sort of his role. Obviously, Kelderman and Koos will be uh, after him in the train, but is he a better climber than Benoit? I think so, oh, yep. on good form. Um, now, his, his form at Tour de Suisse was okay. It yep. wasn't earth-shattering. It was okay. Uh, it wasn't. And so it remains to be seen whether we'll see the Vuelta Banat we saw at the Tour de France last year, which is no guarantee, where he dropped on the Alta Campino and, and Martinez, was going to win that stage and the polka dot jersey, actually. 
because he's been in so many breakaways, but obviously Kuss and, and Vingegaard caught up to him. So it's obviously very high on rouleurs. And as you said, this, this Tour de France has more Denevelle meters than just about any Tour de France we've covered, uh, any, any Grand Tour we've covered, actually, since we started the podcast last four or five years. So it's a very climbing heavy tour. That being said, uh, it's a lot of 7K, 7% climbs. Yeah. Uh, and then, okay, yeah, Puy de Dome, Nathan Van Hoy, not, not exactly going to do the big lead out, but I really, I think this is the way teams will be going in the future, Benji, because let's, if you compare to Trek, mm-hmm. would Juan P. Lopez make this team better? El Patron if would he, make every team better. He, okay, apart from with the <laughs> camaraderie, if he replaced Teish Benoit or Dylan Van Bala. No. You don't, yeah, I agree. I don't necessarily think so, because there's so many terrains next to mountains where Benoit can also be helpful, and Benoit has also not got them terribly. He can face the second climb in a, in a three-climb, four-climb stage, for example. I will say, however, we've spoken about it limitedly so far in our discussion, the thing about being sole leader, that's going to have some effect on how Jumbo Visma need to ride and take out Pogacar necessarily. But there's also the difference that I feel like Vingegaard has gotten better because last year during the tour, that was 7 kilometers, 7% stages, Patrick. Those stages sound like stages to me where we would have said, this is Pogacar territory. Has that changed? Um, well, let's take Perigude, for example, right? Perigude UAE took their best shot. Björk yep. dropped Van Aert, but no. McNulty dropped Coos. It was it was two UA on one, and it was it was we said all that we said a year before that stage. This is Pagacha stage, back to back to back twenty minute climbs, about seven eight percent with a punchy finish at Perigude, and uh, the okay yeah we we always think on a seven percent finish if they're together Pagacha's going to win the sprint. I still think mm-hmm. that, but I don't really see why he would be dropping Jonas off the wheel too much uh, and we'll talk about adam yates and maybe ua will try something differently because all they really did like the gacha very exciting last two weeks last year but all he did after he got dropped on granola was smash yeah, he didn't try really, he, he tried no i credit him trying try uphill try downhill but it was just smash yep um and, and so maybe they, they think we need to do something differently yeah, but i don't know is there something else they could have done last year knowing no. that yeah, they were in the a situation. The team was on its knees. They had like four eyes left? <laughs> yeah, they did the best they could. So you're right that duo leadership potentially at UAE is an option. So let's talk about UAE for a second. Oh, no, I, I want to finish on Yumbo. Okay. A, I think we haven't really spoken about, um, obviously, Kelderman Coos. Kelderman, I don't believe, co-leader. Kelderman Coos, Mountain Domestiques. Yeah. Um, GC Coos? Uh, I did. I brought up with him the other day. You wouldn't. I said, come on, this is your chance. Low TTK is hilly TT. Yours isn't even that good. No, I didn't say that. Well, I didn't say that. I believe it, though. Um, <laughs> the, you, you briefly mentioned Van Aert. So Van Aert's child is maybe due um, between Worlds and Tour de France. I don't know exactly. There's a possibility he leaves a tour. He said he's not going for green. Like, what do you think his role should be then? Because on stage one, what do you think the hierarchy should be? Where we had Calais last year, is is he allowed to still do the Calais stuff? Wout Fanat is 100% going for stage one. I truly believe Fanat is going to go for stage one next to Vingega. Knowing that, let's say that Fanat goes for the stage, he has an opportunity to take some bonus seconds from Pogacar, because Vingega is probably not going to beat Pogacar anyway at the end of a stage one. We'll talk about yeah. the specific profile in a second, but also next to that, I believe that Wout Fanad will go for stages while being a domestique for Jonas Vingegaard as a build-up towards the World Championships. That's how I see it at the moment. And the thing about, I won't go for the green jersey. Mate, you're amazing on every bit of parkour in this race. You're likely going to get points accidentally everywhere. If you go for the flat sprints, you're going to gain points for top five positions. If you go in the breakaway on, on, a, on a transitioning stage to try and win the stage, you're probably going to end up taking points at the end of that stage. You're probably going to be like, I'm in this breakaway anyway. It's like a 10 meter effort to get these 20 points. Why not yeah. cross, cross that line in first? You never know that accidentally get the green jersey. He started I going for like... polka dot last year. <laughs> exactly. He would have won it. <laughs> so 
I believe that Wild for Night is definitely going to be competitive for green, if and if he, even if he doesn't actively look for it. Yeah, and it sounds like he, it's more likely he finishes the race than doesn't finish the race. So he would basically just have to stop trying at cycling to not be competitive for green. I don't think he's going to stop <laughs> trying at cycling during the tour. Maybe he does, I don't know. Um, I think you will be doing the tug buddy, by the way, on the merch. Uh, we, we couldn't organize it in time uh, for, the, for the Tour de France, but we're still working on it. We've obviously got the, the hard bit done, which is the awesome designs, but the logistics in the background. Uh, but that's why we're wearing samples. Uh, but no promises, but maybe Vuelta Espana, we will uh, we will have that available. Anyway, it's a simple team, Benji, because it's Vingar for GC, Vanat, quote unquote, him being selfish, as you said, taking bonus seconds, takes bonus seconds away from Pogaccio. So win win. It, there's also double the bodyguards for Vingegaard as compared to last year. You had to split the bodyguards between Roglic and Vingegaard. Oh, yeah. And we saw on the Roubaix, the cobble stage, that's actually quite a difficult task. And eventually someone loses out in that situation. So pretty straightforward team actually compared to last year. UAE, Bo, Benji, Bjarg, Adam Yates, Trenton in. He didn't do it last year from memory. Langen, mm -hmm. Groschartner, Pagacha, Micah, Soler. This has got to be the strongest team Poggy's had around him for a tour, right? I think so. I think Trenton last year had to skip because of COVID, COVID. if I recall correctly, yeah. very last minute. There's definitely more ruler support, and this is something we've been hammering in the past that I felt like there was not enough ruler support to counteract the, the breakaway attempts of a, of a Wout van Aert, of a Benoit, of a Van Hooydonk. Like, UAE didn't have that strength to close those attacks down at the start of stages, and therefore couldn't control breakaway satellite riders. Now, I'm not sure they're still strong enough to control Wout van Aert. If he wants to get in the breakaway, he, he might be able to do that, but at least there's riders to do it now. They did have bad luck when it comes to the amount of riders they had left after week two last year, but I would say that this team is stronger. And when it comes to supporting the mountains for Pogaccio, you've got Marca, you've got Soler. Adam Yates is an interesting one because on one end you'd say he's great mountain support, but on the other end, he could be that man that stays close in GC and they play around with that. Do you believe the cards, the table have, has turned since last year and it's a 2v1 from UAE standpoint? Now? Yes. 100%. I believe okay. I am like fully behind. Adam Yates is co leader, equal co leader yeah. with Pagacha. Um, and I know that sounds a little bit outrageous, but if you think about who he's replaced, right? He or she is replaced by Trenton, mm -hmm. and Bennett is replaced by Yates in this team. Bennett didn't really, apart from on some of the breakaway stages, he didn't really make too much of a difference last year. Mm -hmm. in terms of affecting the race. I really don't see... And McNulty is replaced by Groshana. Sorry. I, I think that's actually a bit of a downgrade. I don't think... Groshana doesn't have the peak of McNulty. He's been out. How do you Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Maybe about that, yeah. Um, I don't really see a situation, particularly in the first two weeks or 12 stages, where I could say... No, nah, it's necessary to help Pagacha for Yates to sacrifice his GC there. Yeah. Like on Puy de Dome, should Yates do a full lead out for Pagacha and lose time because he's done that, like a Micah would? Should he do it on Tourmalet? Should he do that on Marie Blanc? I don't see that. Micah can do it, Soler can do it, and Groschartner can do it. And so I think they are 100% going to keep Yates in GC. Also, because they're obsessed with points, they want to win the UCI points for the year almost as much as the Tour de France. And with Crazy. Poggy's, uh, I know, but this is that is how they operate. Poggy's wrist and recovery. I know you look good at Slovenian national champs, but I'm sorry, it's not the Tour de France. It is on. He hasn't done a serious road stage yet, and it's going to be hectic. We don't. They don't know exactly how he will go. So I think they'll keep Yates in GC. And hope that Kelvin crashes out, Koos is no good after the Giro, and yeah, you can you can play with Jonas a little bit, uh, like they did last year. I, I really I don't see it being more advantageous to just say Adam Yates lose lose five, ten minutes like a Micah would and just ride in a train for Poggy. Yep, I believe that as well. And if you didn't compare the strength of UE and Yumbo Visma even more directly, we already mentioned, or I already mentioned that we've got a Felix Groschartner 
Benoit type situation. Then Laporte is a better version of Trenton. Then you've got the likes of Van Hooydonk, a better version of Lengen, for example. And when I look at the other right, it's difficult to compare it because who the hell am I going to compare Van Aert to on UAE? That's like a, a real wild card that Hayumbo has over UAE because you can't compare the likes of a Soler to a Van Aert. You can't compare a Micah to a, a Van Aert. In terms of climbing, he's, he's on the level of a, a Soler, sometimes a Micah on a really good day. A really good day. But... I don't believe it. You don't see Van Aert on that level on a very good no. day? Otakam no. was not on that level, or? I think Micah is... Uh, I'll take Micah any day. On pure okay. high, uh, high mountains. Pure high mountains, yeah. Depends. Wout van Aert in the breakaway ahead versus yeah, Micah in yeah. the peloton. Yeah, it's different. It's different. Uh, Micah and Koos is the comparison, and yeah. I'll take... I, I think UAE will have regularly... Regularly, UAE will have four guys mm -hmm. in the last ten. Okay. But I don't think they're going to have numbers in the last four i think it could then be still yates poggy Koos, Jonas. so i think i don't see groschartner really making a difference or soler like they are really good climbers but at the end of the day like if Koos starts ramping it up or kelderman i i think those numbers are going to be a bit of a paper tiger sometimes um but what is a yeah, paper tiger it like looks scary but it's just made of paper it's not really a tiger Okay, useful. I yeah. know that now. I, and I think, as you <laughs> said, you know, the, the Rouleur block of Langenberg and Trenton, it's no match. And, and that was the weakest part of the team. So, Soler's also DNF'd. Uh, he came back and DNF'd the Spanish road race yesterday. He crashed in the Basque Country. So, I don't know what his shape is like. There were some weird Inigo San Milan twists that got deleted the other day, <laughs> <laughs> late did, at night. Did Mark Soler join the Spanish Championships just to make sure he can be selected for the for the world championships oh, is that and the then rule? dipped out in belgium as a rule i think oh okay we're not that's so why... prescriptive in australia <laughs> Van Aert, uh, that's why van Aert <laughs> faked his knee pain last year in my opinion but anyway <laughs> so those are the top two teams is there anything more you uh, you want to say about these two for a second no and, and that's reflected in, in the in the odds like Jonas and pagacha are neck and neck basically mm -hmm. both just over two dollars in the odds for overall gc uh, and if we, I think Adam Yates at not betting advice, but Adam Yates at fifty-one to win the tour and fifteen to top three is is the craziest price I think I've ever seen in cycling. Just about, I think. Okay. Maybe that's a bit of a hyperbolic, but <laughs> he came second in the tour, and there was a big gap from Yates to Hindley and O'Connor. A big gap. He crashed in Catalonia. He was the best climber on her feet. Okay, he always is. His numbers are very, very, very good. He won Romandy easily. Very, very good time trial. R destroyed it on Tion. Good performance. Th second in Dauphiné, right? Second in Dauphiné behind okay. Jonas. Yeah. So I really don't see, based on my assumption that UAE are not just going to burn his GC, I do not see how you could possibly think David Gudu or Carapaz are more likely to podium this tour than, than Adam Yates. What has but been Adam Yates, the history of him? Yeah, what has been that issue with Adam Yates in the, in the past? Because, of course, we know the Vuelta where he just lost the podium towards Jack Haig by not really seeing not that Jack Haig was dropping <laughs> in okay, one of his Ineos. stages. Well, he was on Ineos, Benji. Do you think that's such a major difference where UAE will now be able to get him to that podium step? Because he got, didn't he get fourth in 2016? Yeah. On, uh, on Jayco. I mean, I don't know, he, uh, but we're talking long odds still, you know, yeah. 15 means he's got a 7% chance. I think it's more than that. Um, I, I really think he's looking good at UAE and, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, but the reason I read out the odds was to sort of move on to, uh, the next teams on that list. Uh, in terms of GC teams, we'll go to Bora Hansgrohe, who just, they did two announcements, somewhat curious. Uh, they first announced seven, which was Pollitt, Haller, Jordi Mayus inst instead of Bennett, Buchmann, Hindley, Jungels van Poppel, and then Patrick Conrad was the mysterious eighth climber, or eighth <laughs> rider who was a climber, uh, announced this morning. It's, uh... It's Jai Hindley on his own, man. <laughs> Jai Hindley, <laughs> some stage hunters... And Danny Van Poppel leading up Mayus for just about the first time in the biggest moment. 
And that's real. The, the reason you're not mentioning Bookman is because in the Giro that Hindley won, Bookman offered no support for, for Hindley, even though he was competing for the victory. Because there was a stage where Carapaz went long, for example, I think it was the Torino stage. Yeah. And Hindley was pacing after him while Bookman was in the group. And we were both like, what the fuck is happening here? But anyway, that aside, I feel like this has been the best preparation of Hindley towards the Grand Tour that he's had. Because yeah. he was actually quite good in the last few run-up races. I think at the Dauphiné, yes, he was fourth, he was not second and so forth, but otherwise he was worse before the Giros he was strong at. He so, was $51 to win the Giro before the race. That's, that's pretty crazy. What is he when it comes to the Tour de France to podium, he's, for example? He's third favourite to win in the market. I, he's 15-17. He's third favourite. I agree, I think. I've said my piece about Yates, but I think um, I think Hindley should be fourth or fifth favorite. I mean, him and O'Connor may be a bit of a wash. I'll have to give the edge to Hindley because on the longer climb in the Dauphiné, I think he maybe races a little bit more strategically and he dropped O'Connor on Crotter uh, Fur, but then O'Connor dropped him on the, the steep finish. So they're quite close in ability. O'Connor podium largely because of the TT in the Dauphiné. But mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Hindley's preparation is really good. And, and as I said, like, would you rather have Bob Jungles there to help you position for the last climb because uh, he's made it over the second last climb and then he can't really help you on the climb? Or, or? Juan, Juan P. Lopez or, or, <laughs> uh, no, or Aliotti, Aliotti, for example. Like a, a pure dedicated climbing domestique like Aliotti. I think you take Jungles and he can also win a stage. He won a stage last year for Azure Desire. I agree, even though I don't like the disrespect to Alpatron once again. I feel like you're really hitting hard I changed hard to Aliotti. Yeah. Or Fabro. Alpatron has feelings as well, eh? I yeah. know that he doesn't, doesn't show them, but he does have feelings. Nonetheless, I, I agree with you. And, like, I don't even feel like fighting for the podium does not necessarily require the best team in the first place. No. That's why we always complain about riders that are wanting to get on the podium or wanting to get a top five, that they want an entire team around him that doesn't need to go in the breakaways and so forth, not allowed to have a sprinter, because so many riders podium Grand Tours without support or with very limited support. Like, one or two riders that support can already help you because who's going to be riding on the mountains? It's going to be Yumbo or it's going to be UAE against each other. Yep. And yes, there might be one opportunity in a Grand Tour where you can benefit by having your own team pace or something, but that's so limited, those opportunities, that there's no real necessity for having an entire team behind you. And I don't necessarily mind that. I like that they've got a sprinter option here. It's not Benedict Jordi Meus, which is a, a curious discussion. I think it's wrong, actually. It's weird, huh? I've, like... met, I've, I've been, I've been <laughs> a, a Bennett, you know, not the biggest proponent of him <laughs> for probably three years. And I don't like the way he races a lot of the time, but... It is very funny to me that the criticism of Bennett was that on stage two of the Dauphiné, despite getting the perfect lead out, when he went to sprint, he had nothing in the legs. When Groenewegen had been dropped before that point because it was so hard, that finish. And so many of these finishes, the Bordeaux stage is like 800 meters elevation over like 200 Ks. It is a pure big boy sprint. And... I think Bennett's shape was, like, fine. Like, okay, it's not the best, but do you really think Mayus is more likely to win a big bunch sprint than Sam Bennett? I don't think he is more likely. I won't lie. I haven't watched Jordi Mayus as closely as some other people seem to have because I've heard quite a bit that if he has the position, he can actually compete for that stage win. With Van Poppel, he's going to have the position if he's able to hold on to the wheel and able to have chemistry with Van Poppel in that way. But I need to see it first. He lost I... to Sagan in the Tour de Suisse sprint and Pavel Bittner. My issue is that even in like meh form, Bennett can win a Tour de France stage on the wheel of Van Poppel. I think so, And yeah. if Jordi Meus does it, then fine. They're right in doing so. It's a gamble, in my opinion. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I just, like, yeah, people, oh, Jordi Mayer's positioning, but he got beaten by Christoph, Tobias Lund Anderson, and hey. uh, Mike Turnison. No, I'm saying uh, they're good, but, like, he's not, 
he's not coming third even in in UA sprints now. Maybe he didn't have the opportunity. I, I see him more as a sort of you know he came eighth in Kerna. So I, that's kind of a curious decision. Is it related to Bennett leaving the team? He is obviously I would say leaving the team. It's fucking crazy. He's done one Tour de France, Benji, in the last seven years, and the only that tour he did, he won green and Champs Elysees stage. So <laughs> I I don't quite agree with that, despite being a bit of a turnaround because I've always been a bit of a um, but the, the team, Benji, to me is stage, stage hunting with Jungles, with Hala and Pollitt and Conrad in the sort of week two-ish stages. Mm -hmm. Sprints with Maus, GC with Hindley. That's how I see it. Uh, pretty straightforward. Bahrain, they bring two GC leaders, both uh, from the Basque Country, Bill Bal and Landa. Uh, this is another very similarly constructed team. You then have Jack Haig as sort of, I would say, the Buchmann role. He's mm -hmm. not going for GC. Uh, he, he's been drafted in. He's already had a lot of race days. Can he help? He can help in the well, class, maybe getting a breakaway. Buchmann will probably try and go for GC, though, in comparison to Jack Haig. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I, I don't. Buchmann, German, I think Buchmann might get trying in the breakaway. I okay. don't know. And then but, for... Oh, sorry, go on. Bauhaus. Bauhaus oh, at, yeah. to Tour de France. Uh, is he allowed to do World Tour races <laughs> in France? <laughs> he did. I think two Giros or three Giros he started. I think he finished one of them. Yeah. But to see him at the Tour de France is such an unexpected thing for me. This is a guy that usually does the to the Hungary, Tour de Slovenia, uh, Benelux Tour, all those kind of races throughout yeah. the entire season and gets one opportunity at, at the Giro then. Bologna. Every now and then. <laughs> Bologna, exactly. Yeah. And he goes to the Tour. I'm actually really hyped to see that. Yes, he's not the cleanest sprinter every single day, but... It's to be smart. able to see him against top-level sprinters in this Tour de France, I enjoy it. And this team's another... Yeah, you just see how these teams are hedging with their team construction. They have two... They have one and a half GC riders. You know, one crashes out, the other one might get yourself a top 10, a Bilbao, but you've got the main one in Lander. You've got breakaways for transition stages in Fred Wright and Morich. You've got sort of climbing support that can help a little bit Haig and Pauls for Bilbao and Lander, they might get in a break too. And then you've got a dedicated last man, Nicky Assant, Danny Van Poppel, and a, a sprinter, Bauhaus and Jordi Mayus. And then Wright and Morich on the pure sprint days will also help with the lead out. So this is Bahrain and Bora and, and even Jumbo to a certain extent are constructed very, very similarly. Um, and it just goes to show how they're like, you cannot go to the Tour de France. The mm -hmm. biggest race of the year Unless you have Poggy or Jonas and say, we are all around this rider, or Yumbo at the Giro. What if Roglic didn't win the Giro or a stage Benji? That would have been the biggest waste of time. Yep. Like, and they didn't go in a single break. They, didn't, they wouldn't have won a single stage. So just, that's just what he won. He won the stage, but it's fine. But this is why we're seeing these teams. They're like, we have to give the sponsors something. We cannot go in August, not win a stage, not top five GC. And just be anonymous. Is that directly what brings us to Groupama? Yes, we're skipping Ineos and Movistar for a second, but we'll the Groupama discussion right now. Godu did not look at the Dauphiné. Did look better at the French Championships, but that's a right. different style of race. I'm hoping that he's good for the sake of the damn team. Because they decide to get Godu with some breakaway opportunities for Pinot. They also mentioned Kung for breakaways and so forth, which I like. I hope they go forth with that because... Otherwise, they're really hedging towards... Otherwise, they're putting all their eggs in the basket of Godu GC. So I want to see that. But they leave the Mar home and basically skip out on at least six sprint stages, right? At least. At least. And also, you can. it's useful to have a sprinter sometimes to position you before climbs. And I would say DeMar would be very good at that. If you look at Laporte positioning Vingegaard before important moments... It's actually Ovan Hoidonk. It makes a really big difference. And I don't think Pasha can do the same. And yeah, it's just, Demar's just a fucking good rider as well. Like, there's yep. some of these, these, these stage 18, 19, the, or the one Pedersen won last year. He's just a good rider. He also, he was climbing well in Swiss, I think, to prove a point. I'm not sure if you read the full list out, Benji, but yeah, Kung, Pasha, Legac, Lars Vandenberg, who didn't even know he was on the long list for the Tour de France has been brought in. <laughs> uh, I'll get back to that. Genietz, I like him. Good rider. Godou, Madouaz, just won French National Championships. And Pino, 
I'm going to go off a little bit, Benji. You can go get yourself a coffee. I've been talking about this on Twitter. I said it the night before on Twitter. It's actually a disgrace what this, what, what they are doing with this team is a disgrace. And I'm not surprised that a rumor came out very shortly after the Damaro mission um, that Madawaz wanted to leave. Because the, the way the Damaro mission was handled is a disgrace. He was told in November, by the way, a guy that's won nearly 100 races for the team, including a monument, and there are a Tour de France stage in Giro, Ciclamino, multiple Giro stages. He was told in November he's doing the tour. His wife had booked accommodation for the Tour de France. His form was fine in Swiss. It was fine. It was, you know, he got beaten by Binny. And with Binny's sprint, if you look at the numbers, was actually crazy high level. And the reason he's not going is because Godu doesn't like him. You cannot tell me, and, and it's obvious when you see Stora, because Stora's form wasn't good enough, and the whole mirage was he's not going because Godu needs mountain support. And then Stora wasn't good enough, and they take Lars Vandenberg. Okay, and then that means it's personal. That means you're just not taking Demar because you don't want him in the team. And he said, Demar, I just need Scotson. That's it. Like Bahrain with Arnton Bauhaus. Like Bora with, he- with Mayerson Van Poppel. One leader man, by the way, who can help Godu in tricky, hectic situations. Scotson. Yep. And Godu also publicly embarrassed the team and Demar with his comments back in March or whenever it was about Demar. Demar didn't say anything negative, held his head up and, you know, was really professional about it. And you leave him out and treat him like this because Pino just wants to go and, and you, you basically give him the keys to your team, to a leader who doesn't have any leadership qualities. From what I can see, because uh, I cannot imagine the gacha talking about his teammates, even if he thinks they underperformed, in a Discord like that. Uh, yep. Public Discord. So, you reap what you sow. I mean, if he podiums, even if he podiums, Benji, I'm not wrong. I'm yep. not wrong even if go do podiums, because taking Demar wouldn't have changed anything about that. That's my rant. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a real shame, even if he's leaving the team, which he is, how he is treated, and I think it doesn't make sense. He, he would have been their best chance to win a stage. I agree with you. I, uh, I need to take a breath after that enlightening speech right there, but <laughs> fully agree there. <laughs> fully agree there on your take when it comes to uh, the team, the fact that Demar doesn't necessarily need a full lead out to even try and compete for these sprint stages. The fact that you don't need a team surrounding you entirely, fail to podium the Tour de France, stuff like that. And there's other teams like that. I feel like we then go towards, let's, for example, go to Movistar for a second. They've got Enrique Mas. Matteo Jorgensen, and the support surrounding is Pedrero, who's been pretty good the last few weeks. Dopen, eh? Yeah. <laughs> what was that? What was that? Mulberger, Izaguirre, Guerrero, Oliveira, and the legend himself, the descending guru, <laughs> Alex Aramburu, is in the I team. And it's obviously, the team. <laughs> really. What's he done? He's my dark horse for stage one, my dude. What's he done recently? Preparing for stage one. True. <laughs> Third in the road race, he's actually in good shape. Uh, the Spanish national champs. Uh, I'll give it to you. I'll allow it. That's actually not a bad pick. Why um, is Lascano not at this race? It's uh, a very good question. I mean, I agree, Benji, because you look at this team, right? Hmm? Climbers, Jorgensen, Mascarero, uh, Pedrero, let's say. Yeah. And Milbegger. If he okay, finds but, good but, form. Okay, but... Mulberger and Gorka is a gear. Nice riders, but are they more likely to win a stage than Lascano? A transition stage? No. Are they going to make the difference? Those guys I- helping Mas get a top top four, top five? I don't see it. Uh, I think Lascano would have been better, especially the way he was climbing actually in Tour de Swiss. Now, whether his program or he wasn't ready for it, I'm not sure. You've got Oli. They're also pretty. Who the fuck, Benji? is going to ride the front before the Hayiska Bell to position these seven climbers on stage two. Poor Nelson Oliveira. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because Aaron Brew's going for himself, so he can't take the wind. They have no rulers. They've taken yeah. three pretty good climbers and then two okay cl- It's I don't mind it because I think they're going to go for stages. I hope Jorgensen wins a stage. Uh, but it, it is... 
very lopsided uh, team construction. And, and I think Gorka made the team because he's Basque and it was penciled in for him. Okay. And I, I agree with you. Is, is Lascano Basque? I'm not sure. Um, but maybe no not. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any, any rants about it. I think, yeah, must GC Jorgensen. Do you think Jorgensen will go for GC? I don't know. He was very close to stage wins last year. He got fourth like 17 times in 21 mm. days, like probably four times or three times in reality. But when it comes to their form, Jorgensen has some good results in GC this year. But to have him at the Tour de France for GC the first time around, I don't necessarily expect them to do it. I think they're going to be all out for Henrik Maas in this Tour de France. And do you feel like you have slumbered a bit when it comes to your Henrik Maas hype? Because I swear you were yeah. on the... He's going to put him this Tour de... At some point, you said he was going to win the Tour de France, I swear. Yeah, listen, I'm not as confident after he, um, <laughs> he had dysentery and didn't tell the team the Dauphiné. So, not as confident, but <laughs> he is hoping... Yeah, it wasn't the greatest... Pre him and Godou, big question marks uh, over their preparation. And Lander Land and Carapaz, too. yeah. yeah. Uh, even in home Grand Depart. So, yeah, I'm not as... He's peaking for the Vuelta. Uh, Marcy, just this is training for the Vuelta. Ineos announced their team via the, the Ineos Sport family. I think Lewis Hamilton called out Pidcock's name. Bernal's in there, former champion. Carlos Rodriguez. Kwiatkowski, the experienced Turner, injured this year a lot. Freyler, Pidcock, Martinez, Castro. So we have the, the Hispanophone contingent, and then mm -hmm. two Brits, and then uh, Quiato. So I see this team as... Four riders going for GC. Pidcock, Bernal, Rodriguez, Martinez, and uh, maybe Turner, Cuiato, Frailer in some breaks. And Castro? Like Castro got in the break in the Dauphiné. Do you have any confidence in Pidcock GC after what he's shown when it comes to a GC recently this year? No. Because I swear, like, that, that boat has sunk for me at the moment. While if I look at the other riders in the team... Is Ineos the furthest away from winning the Tour de France at this very moment with the squad they are signing up? Because Egan Bernal, yes, I'm super happy that he's able to be back on the bike, that he's able to be at this level that he's at, that he's able to potentially top 10 this Tour de France, but I don't write him down for a top 3 Canada tree at the moment. Same thing for Rodriguez based on his recent form. Based on last year, I would have said, oh, maybe he can step up and do top five attempt at the Tour de France, for example. Top five is not impossible. But I also find it very difficult to say, oh, they're going to top three, for example. Martinez, I have no confidence this guy is so, as inconsistent as a block can't, of soul. Can't do three weeks. Okay. And Pitcock, I don't believe in it at the moment based on what I've seen. So we're looking at a team where I'm like, okay, these riders can... Can each try and top 10 a Tour de France? I just don't see it for, for two of them at the moment. They might end up with two in the top 10. But Pitko can take stages. Martinez almost won on Autocom last year if it wasn't for Wout van and then the others coming back to GC riders. Yeah. So they've got those options. Frale can win a stage. Castro has shown that he can nearly win a stage. So after winning the Spanish uh, time trial championships, maybe yeah. he feels and the... And definitely break with Zim and cooked him. Yeah, the winning feeling is maybe coming up. So maybe he can do that. So. Are they the furthest away from a Tour de France victory, knowing that I haven't remembered a Tour de France since 2010, 2011, where they weren't candidates for the podium in my head? Because last year, Thomas was the first rider behind the Yumbo and UAE riders for us, right? Uh, I don't know. I feel like Thomas was a little bit underrated going into last year's Tour, but he wasn't far away either. It wasn't like he was a complete dark horse. I think Bernal podium in this Tour would be very, very surprised. As yeah. you said, if any of these riders podium the tour, very surprising. I think Bernal is by far the most likely to top five. I know it's training data, but he's cranking out some very, very good numbers this week in Nice. 6.7, 6.8 for 10, back-to-back -back with over-unders, doing seven for 35 seconds during those uh, over-unders. So it's um, he's also got the pedigree, and he's smart, and... Yeah, I trust Bernal a little bit more. And I think he's actually, he was on a really good trajectory and got slowed down, not because he's on the Froome trajectory. He just crashed a lot this year. And I, I, I trust Bernal. That doesn't mean I think he'll podium, but if any of these guys, they all have shit form coming to this race. Or not great form. 
I would trust Bernal to have turned it around. Um, maybe that's just because he's the only one that publishes power on... on uh, and Martinez might be leaving the team. Apparently, he might be going to Bora, so... Yep. Um, again, maybe a bit light on rulers, but I, I think it's a decent enough uh, team. I think everyone will get freedom. Uh, DSM bring... Well, I'll go a little bit more quickly now. Another uh, mixed team. This one's a little bit more just a GC and a, a sprinter, which is Bardet as their GC leader, supported by Dinham and Chris Hamilton. Hamilton was quite good on Galibier last year, and yeah. Kevin Vermarker, the young American. Uh, he's, he was actually quite good recently with Bardet. And then they have the sprint team, and the lead out is Degenkolb, Echoff, and Edmondson for Wellsford. I think that might be the best lead out Wellsford's getting or had this year. So they had to take Wellsford. Does, you know, I know Sam's listening. Does he survive Juplan stage? <laughs> I don't know, but there's a lot of sprints before. Hey, Sam, just, just dip. Just dip. You've got the Vuelta coming up too. Just win two stages before stage 14 and then win some Vuelta ones. Don't do the extra. Don't do, don't do cold dollar low stage. Don't put yourself through that. Um, yeah, I think it's a decent enough squad, Benji. Yeah, I think so as well. Looking forward to, uh, to hopefully seeing the rumor confirmed that he's going to Bora. We've seen that from the filler flits. Everyone's going to weeks. Bora. And Everyone's Judah. going to Bora. Are you going to Bora? That's a good question. Anyway, nah. very similar team <laughs> in Jayco. As in, they've got Grunewagen as their Wellsford. Yeah. They've also got a team surrounding him with Mezgetz, who's been in good form recently. And then when it comes to the mountain contingent, they've got Simon Yates with on his side, the likes of Harper, the likes of Craddock, and... Um, You've run out. <laughs> I've run out of names. Yeah, it's more, this one's more <laughs> 75% a sprint team. <laughs> Um, yeah, but, but it's true. Why would you? It? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. need it. He can podium this race potentially. He can top five this race without a team. And who's the other Australian climber who's kind of quite actually low key good on Jayco? Oh, no, 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 no. Because they missed that, that one. Calm Scottson. Calm Scottson. Is he injured? I don't know, my man. He who's that the dude that climbed Giro. well? in one of the races that was unexpected in Swiss. Giro Breakaway, no? Yeah. So I would have maybe expected him to be here if he was in shape instead of Yul Jensen, because he's better than Yul Jensen, frankly. Uh, anyway, Azure Desert aren't announced, but I can tell you uh, their two leaders are Gaul and O'Connor. I think that's a 1A, though. O'Connor is the true leader, but Gaul yeah. is in a situation way, where he won't lose GC. I think they also just announced that Van Avermaet is not going. Ah, okay. I'm not surprised by that. Not surprised. I mean, a few teams are kind of doing they're, they're avoiding the sunk cost fallacy israel will get to a few teams yep. are saying i don't care that we're paying you three million that's done that mistake better we take a young guy to the tour who might do something than take you to do nothing uh they'll be dorian godon who's been very very good this year and they'll be supported by uh narson nons Pates. Have they announced anybody else ah uh, yes they have uh, Clement Berthe, who's actually a breakout. Ooh. He's very, very good. 25-year-old. I think he might have been ex-mountain biker. Good climber for uh, Azure Desert. Narsen, Aurelien Parry Pantra, who's very good in the Giro. Won a stage. And Kosnifra. So, and Sander Wolf. I think it's a very nicely balanced team, Benji. You've got Kosnifra for the opening stages. He's been rubbish. Like, Kosnifra's really been... He has one race where he's really good, and then there's just no consistency with that. Yeah, but... Is Yaiskabel too long for this man? <laughs> oh, you mean Cote de Pique? Well, the second stage. The opening stages. Oh, second stage, you got no chance because he won't win the flat sprint. Yeah, that's true. That's you, think, you, think, stage, you, you think the open is just categorically too hard? No, I don't think in stage one he can win either because, yeah, Cote de Pique, Pike Bidea, whatever you pronounce it, it's a climb that fits him 100%, but it's 20k from the finish line and there's an uphill sprint at the end. And there's better sprinting punchers that will follow his wheel and beat him on the line anyway. Yeah, I kind of agree. So they've got climbers in Berthe, Gold, Parapancho, O'Connor. They've got a couple of punches. They've got some classics, rulers, Nars and Dwarf to keep the small boys safe. And Nons Pertez obviously can go for the small uh, boys. a mountain uh, stage win, which he's done before. Uh, is there anyone else? EF that we don't know. EF will be led by Paulus, Court, Carapaz. Betty they're going to extend... So, which I was surprised by. Carapaz, we're not sure of his shape, honestly. And Little Trek have also announced their team again. They got Pedersen as the sprinter, supported by Kirsch, Thurvin, uh, and Quinn Simmons as sort of the Morich role. And then they have the climbers in Chicone, Juanpe, 
and Schielmoser. Schielmoser, I think, is the GC guy uh, based on Twitter Swiss, and Ciccone will maybe go for stages or try and hang there in GC. I'm not quite sure, but actually. Would you rather have Juanpe or Juanpe? Uh, who's, well, who's what? Who's That's Juanpe? the question you've been asking for like the entire day. <laughs> oh, would you rather have Juanpe? Well, um, I think Juanpe is... Pompey's fine in, in this in this team. They've they've left out they've left out Molima, uh, which was yeah. I think not a bad idea. I would have taken Julian Bernard instead of probably Galloper. And uh, I, I was Edward Turns based, is obviously yeah. He's based out. on the the yeah. last year I would agree. But I feel like the French championships, Galopin was actually strong. And maybe dad bought him the spot. Maybe that's what bought him the spot. When it comes Maybe. to the climbers, yeah, Skelmoza look good, eh? Let's be honest about it. To the Swiss, yeah. he look good. I, f- I hope he can try and fight for a top 10 in GC. I believe that's a viable thing for him to hunt for. I wouldn't necessarily put the aim too much higher in the first place anyway. Chicone, I um, heard, her, heard some rumors that he's just going for stages, which would be nice because he can actually win quite a few stages yeah, if he does yeah. that from the start. Uh, Grand Colombier is one of the, Okay. Uh, Thibaut Nace is someone they could have taken, but he kind of overlaps with Pedersen a little bit, so he misses mm-hmm. out. I think he should do the Vuelta uh, later in the year, but I doubt he will. Uh, Antomarche, Costa, Zimmerman, Smith for stages, Menkes for a solo top 10 GC mission, <laughs> and then uh, Petit and Turnison is sort of ruler slash lead out for Binny. Binny's the star of that team. They'll be hoping he can win stage two, maybe even take yellow, and Carmagean also there. Uh, they call, yeah, to go for a mountain stage win. Uh, Sudar Quickstep haven't announced. We've got Alaphilippe going for the yellow on stage one, supported by Maori, Cavagna, Seneschal, and then they obviously have uh, half the team is the lead out for uh, Fabio Jakobsen. Mercury is his last man uh, for the pure bunch sprints. Anything on those two teams, Benji, before we do Israel and Lotto and then, and then uh, roll into the stages? What, sorry? A- anything on Quickstep? Is there any... It's pretty straightforward, well, I think. It is straightforward. Alaphilippe's going to be fighting for yellow at the start. He's going to try and... Hold yeah. I do feel like Alaphilippe should try and go into the breakaway old Alaphilippe style again. Like on a, a stage like Paul Aran, the one we had where here he she was fighting and so forth. He's in breaks. He, he's going to be he, that who guy. Who was he trolling? Was it Gorka Izagira he was trolling in that break with Hirschi? He kept attacking and then dropping in the I don't Laurent. remember. He's such... He's so good. Such good entertainment value. <laughs> he, he is for certain. And even a Cavanyar could go on a stage 19 breakaway. Yeah. Stuff like that could happen. Even though they've got Jakobs, you never know if that opportunity for the breakaway is more likely for them. Yeah, I, I want them to go for breakaway, stuff like that. But Jolie, I want him to step up. He needs to step up. He's been yeah. so stagnant recently, and I kind of feel like he's stuck. And I want to see him change about that, because otherwise he's just leaving the team for me if I ha- had to make the decision at, uh, at the end of this season. But yeah, Alaphilippe is going to be the man there, going to be fighting for it at the start. I love the Israel team. I love the Israel team. It's, it's skipping out on Chris Froome, which, to be honest, is a sunk cost fallacy. Not anymore, because they're not putting more sunk cost into it. Is that how it works? Yeah, so taking, he... taking Froome would be a sunk cost fallacy. Okay, or is he still a sunk cost fallacy because they're still paying his salary? Well, I think they should buy him out, but that's maybe an off-season discussion. I really <laughs> think they should try and buy him out. But yeah, they leave him and full sang at home. Broom, despite being an equity, I think having equity in Factor and, and who own also Black Ink Wheels, said that the reason he didn't perform in the races leading up to this was because of equipment problems. Um, yeah, so he says he'll be back at the Wait, tour next year. Do the legs count as equipment? I mean, apparently he trains really hard, so like I, I'm sort of past the point where it's I want to just bash through him, but then he says shit like this, and it's like, dude, like you're not... Everyone knows the reality now, just... Anyway, just say you weren't at the level you wanted to be at. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, they take Schultz, turns Ul Bovin, Ul who won a stage last year, Nayland Strong as their sprinter, Michael Woods for as a puncher for stage one, and Simon Clark. so it's a very strong team for breakaways just like the Giro d'Italia yeah. and that's what they will be focusing on I don't know if Turns will go for top 10 on GC he did top 10 the Tour de Suisse but nah. this is a whole different kettle of fish I think they're all in on breakaways and they've got they've got three guys uh, Clark Ull and Turns who have won breakaways in the Tour in the mm-hmm. last two years and 
Schultz was a photo away from being a fourth guy. So they know what they're doing in that aspect. Woods KOM is also a possibility, I think, looking at his True. team. I think he tried. Okay, 2021. I forgot which year it was. With, but... with uh, pulls. Yep, that's certain. And yes, we've got that breakaway team of Israel. I love that stuff. If we go to Lotto, we've got a combination of Caleb Ewan with the riders like Maxim van Hills, Frizo, and so forth. I love Maxim van Hills at the moment. Yeah, he's I so want to see where he can go. I believe he can win a stage in a Grand Tour. But I do believe that the Vuelta is probably the best Grand Tour for him to try that. I'm not sure the Tour de France is the one where he'll hit that right the first time around. But you never know. He's, he's going to be in breakaways. He's pretty fucking good. He like, is. he was against serious guys in the Ardennes. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's a lead-out focused team around Caleb Ewan. It hasn't been that successful so far. Um, Guarnieri is last man for Ewan. How have we gone this far and haven't said a single thing about Alperson? Because we were just getting to the sprint teams. We'll, do, we'll even do Cavendish after Alperson. But yeah, Alperson bring Matthew van der Poel, obviously, is the going for yellow on stage one. And then Philipson is their, uh, their leader, or plan B, actually, as they called him in the Netflix series. <laughs> uh, Soren Kraut Anderson, I believe, will be there alongside uh, Ricker and maybe some other rulers. They haven't announced yet. They're announcing in about 15 minutes on Zwift, I think. Uh, yeah, like Philipson's the best sprinter in the race. And... The lead out is depends. Do you think Van der Poel will give, be giving him lead outs like Bauer's a Belgium tour every time? Yes, I believe the the go to role for this team is Philipson with the lead out of Van der Poel with some more riders to lead him out. Breakaway opportunities for Kronerson in a stage nineteen if it doesn't go for the peloton and so forth. But mainly, if Philipson needs more points because he wants to go for the green green jersey this time around, which I love it. We've got a battle, hopefully. Then, in hilly terrain stages where the green jersey points are early on in the stage, then we might see attacks with Philipson and Vanderpool going in the breakaway together. Vanderpool helping Philipson to get more green jersey points, and then Vanderpool going on to try and win the stage afterwards. I think there's a stage in there in the Tour de France where I would love to see that happen. Yeah, I mean they collaborated in in Paris Bay to great effect, and I, I think they those two have good chemistry. So I'm keen to see how they make it work in the tour because obviously Van der Poel really wasn't in any sort of shape at the tour last year. You can just draw a line through that Tour de France. Yeah. He looked much better uh, at Dutch National Championships and Belvoir's a Belgium tour in the last month or so. Uh, otherwise, just quickly rounding out the other teams, Cofidis, I quite like their team. They've got Kokard as their sprinter uh, with Zangler, which is somewhat curious. Maybe like Zang. <laughs> I don't know how that will work, whether Zangler will be the lead-out for Lecoq. I, I like both those riders. Renard is definitely the lead-out. Geshka missed out on KOM last year. Izagira will go for mountain breaks, and, and Martin will go for GC with sort of Perez as the uh, a, a sort of a miscellaneous climber. I remember he was pulling, actually, like even... He was pulling at random points when UA and Yumbo decided to stop bashing each other in, in the tour last year in a valley before a climb. So I quite like the team. It's, it's basically the best possible team Cofidis could bring, and they're going to try and break a, a Tour de France stage win drought. Astana have finally brought Bowl to lead out Cavendish. They've also brought in Mark Renshaw, consultants all the rage, Benji, these consultants in cycling, um, as a sprint lead out consultant, and maybe his first order of business was maybe you should take the guy with Cavendish, who you signed to be his lead out <laughs> to the same race as that in. Better off Moscon. Louis Leon will try to do help with that lead out. They've got Tejada, who was good in Swiss for sort of climbing stuff. And Lutschenko can always, you never know, Lutschenko can win a stage you know, from a breakaway. And Dela Cruz is strong enough as a climber. So, But it is all about Cav here and, and a Lutschenko stage, I think. Yes, I think so as well. Lutschenko stage, when I'd love for that to, uh, to be the aim again, I... I hope he's not going for a top 10 again in GC because I like those Lutsenko breakaway stages. The first week ones where he would go in that breakaway to do it. You never know. He might still go for a top 10. We'll see. But Arkeo then, Sean Poussin, Bargill, those riders are going for uh, photo likes of, uh, well, stages, I would hope. They might yeah. have signed Sean Poussin as GC rider, but I don't Should've fucking believe it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Facts. this team looks a lot different without Nairo sitting at, like providing structure for GC, right? <laughs> Who else is there? Because, like, if they we got, look at Sean Poussin they, they can get stage wins. Oh, Mozzato. Yeah. Yeah, Mozzato, yeah, but he, he's good at positioning himself, but can't get overriders in the sprint. So he's the kind of rider that might get 7, 8, 7, 7 in sprints. No Hofstetter. I don't know if I he's don't mind injured. That. I'm happy for Mozzato. 
Yeah, they're much of a muchness, aren't they? Total brings Sagan and Kras and Bosenhagen and Bergado, who's okay. Toji's not looking himself, so yeah, then I'm not expecting too much from Total, but you never know. Um, I think that's all the teams. Uh, pretty exhaustive run Mate. through. Have I, missed, have I missed a team? You forgot former enemy. <laughs> oh, fuck, that, that wasn't a bit. Oh, that wasn't a bit, I promise. <laughs> Um, okay, Uno you know X wildcard team. I am happy they're here. They bring their best possible squad. Tran, who was good recently in the Dauphiné or something. Varen Skold, very, very good rider. I had a look at him too, but they extended him a bit too quickly, which was annoying uh, for me. <laughs> uh, Sharmig's a good climber. And then you've got Tiller, the big boys, Tiller and Christoph the, uh, as the sprint lead out with, yeah, Johannesson. You, you never know what he could do maybe on stage one or other stages. Do you think that'll be it, Benji? Try and go for GC? and Because Johannes and GC is not happening. He can't climb right now. So he, I think he has to just do Ciccone style and go for, or not even Ciccone, better, he's better than him. He, Conrad style in, in a week two, sort of stage 12. Uh, when it comes to Tobias Johannesson, I feel like the Dauphin his climb wasn't terrible. 15, that's not saying that you can top 10 GC though. So... I would like him to be the the Pare Pantry style where he, oh, he might yeah. lose time initially, then goes in breakaways, and you never True. know that the breakaways might lead him to 11th, 10th in GC at the end, which is unlikely, but at least he might get opportunities for breakaway stages then. True, and Vingegaard said actually on, the, uh, on stage 6 in the Dauphiné, it wasn't caught on camera, he was the man attacking that Vingegaard responded to. So he's in decent shape, I just questioned the long climbing. But again, yeah, it's they bring their best possible team. They're going to want to show themselves, that's for sure. You know, X uh, get, getting that first big wild card to the tour, and so yeah, sprints with Kristoff and then breakaways. They're going to want to want to mix it up. Um, so yeah, and, and obviously because there's no B and B this year, they got their spot. Are we are we ready for the stages, Benji? I'm ready for the stages. There's one important thing to know during these stages. Obviously, 21 stages as always. Tour de France is happening. There is no rest day after stage three because we're starting close to France and Basque Country this time around. So we're hopping straight nine days straight from the start. And most importantly, we're reintroducing the bonus seconds on some climbs in the race. So there's some climbs in stages that give eight seconds for the first rider, five for the second, and two for the third. What's your reaction to that? I mean, <laughs> I don't know if they, I think a lot of them are just going to get taken by the break. I'm not sure. I think there's maybe three or four that will be taken by GC riders and two, three that will be taken by breakaway riders. Yeah. But anyway, I, I think I remember on uh, in, stage, in Tour de France 2020, they had them mm -hmm. on top of Marie Blanc yeah. and that was when Roglic nearly chopped Pogaccia. In hindsight, he probably should have full chopped him and then kept riding. <laughs> so rookie error there. Um so it can make people, you know, sprint for the top of climbs and make something a bit more exciting 25Ks out from the finish. But to be honest, you have it at the top of Col de la Lose. It's like, well, fuck. <laughs> I yep. think they were going to go full gas on Lose anyway. <laughs> um, Is it there? The, I'm pretty sure there's one on top of Col de la Lose. Oh, um, okay. Because this morning I checked and I, I didn't necessarily see like the B on it. But there's maybe like, I'm wrong. they've already adapted a few, by the way. There was supposed to be one on stage one. Stage one is... Uh, yeah, Basque Country time, eh? We're getting to Basque Country for arguably one of the more explosive stars to a Tour de France that I've seen in a very long time. I can't remember a stage one like this no. for the life of me. This and is it's harder than the Brittany ones, right? This is harder than the Brittany yeah. ones, Alaphilippe one. Yeah, Lander no in Brittany was a pretty damn good start with a punchy finish, but this is harder in the sense that this is kind of a, a copy-paste of this Spanish classic called the... Uh, Circuito de Ghecho, but with higher climbing before we get to the second last climb. We've got the combination of the Alto de Vivero, Côte de Vivero in France, and the Pic Bidea or the Côte de Pique, what it's called in French. That is what we've got in this stage. It's a stage of 182 kilometers, so pretty long, but I'm going to guess that this will be going to, uh, to the peloton, knowing that so much is on the line. The first mile <laughs> one is on the line. Yeah. Obviously, people want it. Now the Alto de Vivero, that second last climb is 4.3 kilometers, 7% with roughly 30 kilometers left in the stage. And then we've got the, the Côte de Pique, 2 kilometers, 9.9%, which a bit of a fake news climb, that 2 last, kilometers, 9.9%. The last case is hard. It's like Murahui, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard. And then the finish as well. 
So that's 10 k's from the finish, the crest of that. Then there's a little false flat downhill plateau, and then not much, there's really not much flat. There's maybe a couple of k's, and the uphill finish is actually one kilometer at 5.5%. It is not a flat finish. 5.5% <laughs> uphill after that fatigue in the legs. There's no, sprinters are not making this. Pedersen, I don't think Pedersen makes this. I don't think Philipson makes this. Therefore, maybe the next day, th this is properly hard. And we could even see, I, I, I'm expecting GC gaps on, on Cote Piquet. Uh, I'm expecting guys to get dropped. And yep. uh, because the, there's about 10 Ks or 12 Ks of flat after the Vivero into the base of that, the fight, the shit fight into the base of that climb is going to be unlike is, you know, anything you see except for Tour of Flanders. Into, it's like Omlope into the base of a, a, you know, a major climb, the Molenberg Mate. or something. It's going to be like that. Is it Calais all over again? See, the difference there is this is harder. Those were shorter climbs. You know, these these yeah. are the Viveros, 4.5K, 7%. I think Sprinters already are going there. Groner has yeah. gone there. And then maybe even Philipson, honestly. Pedersen maybe survives. Um, and then... But if you're Yumbo Benji, do you want to just do you want to drop all the sprinters and then Poggy wins? Because he's my yeah. favorite for this stage. It's shocking, huh? Because like you're questioning that and we're thinking about what can Fanard do here with Vingegaard and so forth. And the only thing I can see that Fanard can do here is try and steal bonus seconds from Pogacar at the end of the stage. That should be his goal here. Because yeah. there's nothing that Fanard can do that will make Vingegaard beat Pogacar, I think, in the sprint at the end no. of this stage. And maybe. Yumbo gets lucky and Pogacar's in a bad position and someone else wins and someone else takes the three first spots in Alaphilippe, a Pitcock, a Binyam. Those are the riders I'm seeing in Alex Aramburu, but I'm I think slowly going to mention hard that for name. Binny. Too hard for Binny. It's so hard. It's so hard. And they are going to launch it. Who like? It's very difficult and there's not much time yeah, to but... come back. There's less time to come back than Calais. And then it goes uphill again. And then your legs are fucked. True. True, but like, if we say this is like the Mur de Hui, is it not too hard for a lot of these punchers? I think it's almost too hard for Van Aert. Is it good enough? Because it's 20 kilometers from the finish line. No, 10 k's. A 10 kilometers from the finish line. My bad. Well, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. It's 10 k's from the finish line. Like, there's not a major gap between that and the next hill, so... Alaphilippe should, I mean, based on... I thought our fleet was going to be the favorite, and then I was like, ah, I mean, Dauphiné was really, really good. But uh, I'm going, I'm pick, uh, I'm going to try speed run the stage a little bit more, Benji, than last year. I'm picking yeah. Poggy. Poggy wins the stage. Poggy takes first yellow. Damn it! <laughs> I'm gonna go with. Oh, I got to go with someone else then, eh? I'll go with. I'll go with Pitcock. I feel like okay. On one end, I believe that Vanat can compete for the stage with Pogacar and so forth, that the way to go is for him to try and steal the bonus seconds, but Alaphilippe will be there, Pitcock will be there. I'm going to go with Pitcock. I don't have high hopes either for that because I'm actually on the Pogacar page, but I can't select the same rider. So that's what I'm going with. Aramburu is going to be my dark horse, and that brings us to stage two, which you can lead in. This is from Vittoria Gastais to San Sebastian. This is again... A hilly Basque stage, 210 kilometers. I hope I have the right, right profile. I, I downloaded it a while ago, but it, it, this is what it is. It's basically rolling hills. So it, it is not going to be easy to control a breakaway. It won't be easy yeah. uh, with all those hills. And then the Hayeskabel from uh, the north to south. So this is from Honda Ribia side down towards San Sebastian. The easier side, I would argue... 8.2 Ks, 5.2% with the last three and a half kilometers at over 7%. That crest just about 20 Ks from the finish before a pretty fast descent into, and then a flat section into San Sebastian. This is a flat finish. It's a little pickup beforehand, but this is mm -hmm. a flat finish. I am going with Wafanat to win the stage, Benji, because I think Philipson doesn't make it. I agree with you on that. I think Philipson might die just before the top or something like that. Pedersen, I'm not sure. Probably. Really? I see Pedersen better mm. climber than Philipson. I'm not sure, but I, I, think, I don't think he makes it. Okay. Can I think that... Make it? This is something Binyam should survive, right? Yeah, Binny in really good shape should, obviously. Um, I'm going to go for Binny then. Okay. Do you think... 
Could you see like a Jay Vine attack over the top of that? Could we see? I I wouldn't be surprised. Chikoni, remember Chikoni attack with Bade and, and Vine in the Vuelta. Yeah, maybe a Basque guy goes full threat of death. The problem is the flat section afterwards or certain Kra over the top for Alperson because if Philipson is dropped, well, there's no use holding his hand. Aramburu. Oh, we forgot Van der Poel. Oh, I mentioned him. He's gonna be there to sprint, but you don't trust. Is him he gonna there. be? He can He can win this. Like, let's be honest about it. He can win yeah. this, but. I kind of feel like avoiding Van der Poel and Van Aard because you're mentioning them anyway, so might as well go for yeah. Mini. Okay, can't, can't disagree with that. The third stage, this is a, a stage for the sprints, 190Ks from Amorabieta, Achano to Bayonne. So we cross the border back into France and we have a 5k, 5% climb at the start and then it's rolling hills once again. I think this will be a pure sprint stage. There is a 4k, mm -hmm. 3% big ring climb with, if I can count, about 20Ks from the finish. I think this is a Jasper Phillips and special with some there. This is not an easy stage. It is still a hard stage. I think the break will require some chasing. And I think Jasper Phillips and gets the job done and um, wins the first sprint. I gotta be honest. It's, it's, you it's can pick hard the same for me. As me. Yeah. It's hard for me to start picking different riders every time because I agreed with Pogacar stage one. I agree with Von Aert stage two and I agree with Phillips and stage three. So I agree with that. And, it doesn't necessarily change towards stage four either, because yes, that's another sprint stage. And stage four has a bit of a different finish than a regular one. It's, it's falls flat for 800 meters, which arguably makes it more likely for me that Philipson will win. Yes, Jakobsen was good on the slightly uphill sprint that we Bennett saw. Bennett was fucking good on them. Yeah, but he's not in this race. I know, I know, I know. But that's why I mean, Bennett <laughs> on an easy stage with a false flat. He was, I mean, Paris Nice 2021, he fucking destroyed everybody in the hoods. Yeah. Is this the kind of sprint stage where knowing that it's 800 meters falls flat, that a Vanard, that a Peterson, those riders will be able to pick up some more points that they would do in the in the pure sprints? Knowing that, for example, stage two is 50 points. Vanard's going to be up there in the green jersey points, even with Philipson winning these two stages. So what's your thoughts? I'm going with the big boy. I'm going with Gronewegen to win this sprint. Um, okay. him, him or Fabio, I think this is the first, you know, this is a pure nailed on sprint. I know it's a little bit uphill, but I don't think they'll care too much. Uh, I, 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 actually, I will go with Fabio. I'll go with Fabio. Quick step. Quick step in when they just win Tour de France stages. And I think this is a, yeah. they also will have circled this one as perfect for Fabio. So, and, and as you said, Benji, you know, I think. To date, all the intermediate sprint points, which we haven't mentioned, were all so early in the stage that they were irrelevant for. Um, I, I don't see Philipson or Van Aert taking any any points. Oh, they will sprint for them, but they're not going to go on the breakaway for them. But yeah, uh, this is the same for this one. And um, oh, sorry, we we one thing we did say there is a bonus sprint on the top of Hayeskabel. Does Poggy? I think Poggy will go for it, and then yeah. Yep. I think he'll probably take those seconds. And Vingegaard will have to take five behind him. But yeah, who have you got? I've got Fabio for stage four. Yeah, I had, a, I had Philipson again for stage four. Oh, you do? Yeah. I mean, I it's do. true. If you think he's the best sprinter, I think I did this in the Giro. I just picked Pedersen or someone for every stage. And then he's How wrong were we? <laughs> yeah, true. In stage five, uh, I think I'm doing the odd ones. 162Ks. This is a repeat of the stage nine of 2020. If you want to go and watch a stage... Uh, Exactly the same parkour before from Po, where sort of the gateway to the Pyrenees, Po to Lorraine. Yes, that's right. We're already in the Pyrenees in stage five. Flat first 70 Ks. There is an intermediate sprint there. So this is already we're looking at. Mm -hmm. If Van Aert's, the problem is if he's in yellow. If he's in yellow, it becomes a little bit harder to get in the breakaway. But, yeah, but I, I, th I don't think he is. You Does Philipson Philipson not goes? see? A flat intermediate sprint after 30, 40 kilometers and be like, I might as well go for it as well. He has like, to get in the break. Philipson has to. So he can counter what, what Van Aert is doing. Philipson hasn't necessarily shown that before, but I'd love to see that. Oh, he's a good and rider. Like you said, there's intermediate sprint there. There's also a bonus seconds thing on Marie Blanc. So very similar to Chais Cabell. Bogacha is likely to take those seconds unless there's a breakaway ahead, which is possible on this stage. I mean, yeah, they've got the Col du Soudé beforehand, 15Ks at 7%. That's actually one of the longest, cons you know, consistent pieces of climbing over 7% we have in the race, apart from Tourmalet and, uh, and Col Grand de la Rose. But, but there's, yeah, and Grand Colombier. But there's a lot of flat after that. And, and so if you don't know Col de Marie Blanc, 
It's 7.7 Ks, 8.6%. This might have been the first ever climb we called a fake news climb because it's basically <laughs> yeah. 3 4% for the first 4 or 5 Ks. And then it kicks up the last 4 Ks is about 10.5% and there's a bonus gate at the top. I'm not as convinced the Pagacha on this climb will so easily take the seconds ahead of Vingegaard. Um, okay. I think 4 Ks, 10.5% after a reasonable amount of climbing. I'm, not, I'm less convinced on High Iskabel, it's different. 3K, 7% well, after a sprint stage. Uh, it's pretty obvious he'll win that sprint. But this one, I'm not so sure. If he doesn't, I'm a slight bit worried for the rest of this Grand Tour that Vingegaard will be simply better than Pogacar. We'll because get to these my shorter on GC climbs, later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because looking at these stages, these are the ones where I believe Pogacar needs to be able to have a stand to be able to compete for, for GC. So, will they ride for the stage then? He won I here don't before. Believe it's his they first will. tour win. I don't necessarily believe they will. Because really? there's so many riders that will try and be in the breakaway. Let's go over the list for a second. Turns, Von Hills, Alaphilippe, Simmerman, Aramburu, Betiol, Konrad, Lutsenko, Quinton Hermann, Spitcock, Woods, Clark, Simmons. All these riders could try and go in this Van breakaway. Up, Van Bala, Benoit. Van der Poel? Van der Poel. Certain cry if you hadn't mentioned him already. Like, you're right. Turns wins. I mean, yeah, I think this is this is the Israel one. Jorgensen, I would like Jorgensen in the break here. So, Mateo, yeah. if just just been off 20 minutes and getting the break. <laughs> um, I'm picking Jack Haig for this stage. Really? Um, yeah. Good little Didn't home, see that one coming. Home cook, some home cooking. Um, pick him for this stage. Some home um, cooked, you mean? <laughs> well, I I've got to go with my boy sometime. I haven't picked an Australian. Have I picked an Australian yet? Anyway, you think there'll be GC gaps here? Uh, I don't think so. Not between UAE, the top right? guys. They're not getting someone in the break. They're Yumbo without Yumbo getting two in the break. And mm -hmm. so, it, it's too far to arrive to finish. I don't see big GC gaps. If you lose time here, you're fucked. Maybe there's some rider that loses time today and we see the first cracks in their armor when it comes to a potential top five or something like yeah. that. But I don't necessarily see it for the top rider. So maybe an Ineos rider disappears on this stage. But maybe that in happens on the next stage. Well, they yeah. lost like nine seconds. It was two groups of four. They lost nine seconds in 2020. It wasn't a big deal. Exciting stage, but not huge gaps. Stage six, Benji. Stage six starts in Taba. We've got the Tour Malay stage, basically. It sounds a lot more scary than it is in reality for GC, in my personal opinion. Because halfway the stage, we've got the Col d'Espan, 12 kilometers, 6.6%. We descend towards the bottom of the Col du Tourmalet, which is a souvenir Jacques Godet, which I have no clue what that means. More points on top or some prize of like you get more money or... Yeah, it's five grand. Oh, well, okay. But I don't think double points, only on Loza. Okay, that, uh, that's good to know. That's 70 kilometers, 7.5%, 7.4% that Col du Tourmalet. But then we go into that valley, which often has headwind towards Col Tourmalet, and Col Tourmalet is a really, really easy climb. So it's like, five to six percent for 16 kilometers basically this is to me the kind of stage that goes to the breakaway i don't see gc gaps swallow well from the greatest guys because i don't see anyone attacking on the tour Malay. and again we have the intermediate sprint 50 k's in after a rolling a rolling start um maybe maybe the break forms on the 5.6 k five percent climb and van art gets in there and takes points off Philipson. it's a shame christophe laporte I mean, Christophe Laporte in another universe could win green at this Tour de France. So it is, I, I would yeah. be very interested to see break formation here. This will be, you must watch this stage. I'm a little bit more ambitious for this stage, Benji, because we don't know how Poggy will go on Tourmalet. We don't know what the pace will be like on this stage. I know it's far from the finish, but we will see. How UAE will play Yates and Poggy. Uh, I think UAE will play this stage. I don't know. They could also go for the stage win. because they. But I think they will play super passive. I think UAE will yep. do nothing on this stage. Uh, and I think Dylan Turns wins this stage. To steal your earlier pick. But I think he's better <laughs> in the proper mountains. Um, okay. And so I'll take Dylan Turns here. Israel will be trying to get in every single break. And... Oof. I, I think I think guys will lose big time on on Tourmalet, like uh, 
Someone like Lander or Carapaz or Muffs, one of these guys and two of the Ineos guys are gone on Tourmalet. That's a possibility. I would kind of enjoy seeing a, a Pitcock breakaway on this stage. Perfect finish for him. I agree. The problem is that he might go for GC still. It'll be too close. You have to deliberately lose a lot of time before this. Exactly. So an Alaphilippe, for example, should have lost time by this time. Because yeah, yeah. if, even if he drops a bit on the Tourmalet, on Marie he's Blanc, got a huge he will, descent. He will stop trying. So there is a possibility here to go for the stage if he does that. Quinn Simmons, I'm like on the brink of believing. Yeah. It's Nico um, Densi, Patrick Conrad. Schultz? Schultz, yeah. He and Majev was sort of a 20k, 5% finish. Ticone, all these guys, a lot of... Now, the problem for them, though, is it is a short stage mm -hmm. and it's not that long before the Col d'Aspin. So really, yeah. if the break goes on the Côte de Cap Vin, which is 30k's in, you basically have 25k's where you have to build out your advantage of flat before the climbing starts. So tug I don't buddies. think it's a guarantee. Of course, you need the, you need the tug buddy. Um, I don't think it's a guarantee that the break wins. I think this will be yeah. a very, very good stage, even though it maybe looks a bit um, meh. Uh, stage 7, in contrast from Mont de Marsan to Bordeaux, this is a pure sprint, 170Ks. Uh, I'm going to switch to Groenewegen and Benji because uh, I went with Fabio for the other pure sprint. I'm just, I'm just going to pick a different sprinter for every sprint stage. <laughs> Who else for his mind for this one, then? Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck. You I'm have taking to, the yeah, you pick Welser before me. <laughs> because I'm the real supporter yeah, of Sam here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, next stage. Yeah. This is not a pure sprint stage. Libor and Limoges, 201 kilometers. We've got first half is false flat. There's an intermediate sprint in there. But the second half has some hills. And they're not super hard, but it's up and down. It's like 2.8 kilometers at 5%. 1.3 kilometers at 5.3%. The last of the climbs is like... Conda sur Vienne, which is 1.2 kilometers at 5.4%, with roughly, I'm trying to guess here how many kilometers that is. I'm going to guess with roughly 10 ish, 12 ish kilometers to go, that climb arrives. And the last ramp is 700 meters at 4.3%. So is this the, the Peterson versus Bernard versus Philipson more versatile than a pure sprint sprint? Lecoq! Lecoq takes his first Tour de France stage. He breaks confidence drought. Brian Coca <laughs> wins in Limoges. Come on, no. he has to do it. This is actually perfect stage for him. But attrition, it's not fucking happening. A little bit of attrition. Dude, you see him on Wollonga in the town. <laughs> As a single finish. Wollonga was a decade ago. He, he gapped Betty, old dude. He put everyone on a big gap. Alexis Renard. I'm going with Brian Coca to win this Zangler Renard <laughs> lead out. They are going to... Come on, Lecoq. This has got to be for him. Laporte could win this in a finesse attack. Uh, like, again, could Laporte win this? Maybe. Could Van Aert win this? I don't know. Maybe they should just swap leading out. One of them could also win, but I'm, I'm going with Lecoq, and I'm very excited about it. Okay. Who'd I'm going to go for... I kind of feel like this is the Philipson stage for me as well. Not MVDP. He, this, is the, this is the pure... The... Stage where pure sprinters might get in trouble, but Philipson might survive. Like, yeah, yeah, Van der Poel can fight for the stage. But that's the problem when you have both of them in your bloody team, eh? The yeah, peloton will tricky. be big enough for Van der Poel to say, oh, it's a bunch of sprinters I don't like it. <laughs> Is that how he speaks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you're going with Philipson. Fair enough. Stage 9, 182.4 kilometers from saint Leonard de Nobla to Puy de Dome. This is... It, there's three categorized climbs. There are only... Cat falls and Cat threes before the HC climb, offering full KOM points at the finish before the first rest day. <laughs> but there's three thousand meters climbing, uh, three and a half thousand meters climbing in this stage, and, and that's you know not all from Puy de Dome. The intermediate sprint is at the end of a, a significant hill where we might see, we will see the break forming there in the first thirty kilometers, and that's this is the one of the stages we will really see whether Vanard is serious or not about yeah. i'm not going for green because it i and i bet you we will see him sprinting to join a break or something and philipson dropping uh out here and pedersen will probably try to get the break uh lumpy and then Peter Dome again yeah, fake news climb sorry go on five kilometers four percent will philipson really capitulate trying to follow Vanard up there to try and sprint against him yeah but it's not just it's like everyone's already been jumping for 20 k's yeah. Then you're jumping with Simon Clark with Dylan, like it's it's more the dynamics of it. My dude, Vanderpool tug buddy. Yeah, of course, Sir and Crow Vanderpool, not bad tug buddies to have. 
Um, but yeah, the Finnish Puida Dome, 13.3 kilometers at 7.7%. The biggest fake news climb I've ever seen in history of, of cycling. In fact, this is fraudulent. This profile from ASO, perhaps people, I need to research some French law. This is a fraudulent profile because let's call this 7.5% average. It's basically four, oh, 5k 7.1 percent there's then a 2k section of 4k section of no nah, less than 4k 2 3k section of false light uphill and then the last ramp is 5.1k is 11.1 percent uh around the road goes around the pleated dome outside of clermont Ferrand up to 1400 meters it could be this is going to be stinking hot most likely i think this will be one of those you know how monde and, and like we uh the pui stage pui marie which is mm -hmm. stinking hot and really hard all day I think this is going to be like that before this climb. And, um, but I don't expect huge GC gaps here either. It is still only a 5K 11% climb, and there aren't any even 15-minute climbs beforehand to put in some fatigue. My question for you is, because I don't know the answer myself, so I'm shipping it off to you. <laughs> At this point in the race, based on what we've said so far, Pogacar you're taking a bonus second on Heiskebel, Pogacar being able to potentially win stage one while Vingegaard can't. We haven't really had a moment where we say this is the moment for Vingegaard to strike outside of Houston mentioning maybe Tourmalet could rise up some weakness at Pogacar's camp. But I feel like this is the one moment where I believe we can actually see differences between the two riders. This is where Vingegaard might be able to strike if he's indeed better than Pogacar. This is where Pogacar can strike if he's better than Vingegaard, which is the least likely. I think at the moment, Dauphiné is showing that Vingo is looking to be better on paper, but who knows? Everything might change by the time we arrive on Puy de Dome. But if we see this park where I'm like, is anybody going to fucking control this stage? I or will this go to the break? It's a hard stage. It's a hard ass stage to control for four hours, 160 kilometers all the way around to Clermont Ferrand in the heat. It's a hard stage to control with, as I said, someone like a Dylan Turns. I should probably. Well, Pauls or uh, maybe, some, maybe someone's fallen out. Yeah, Ciccone. People have fallen out of GC at this point for whatever reason. And a Thibaut Pino. So I'm going with Thibaut Pino to win the stage Fuck. from the break. Oh, sorry. I, I just I just see the first it's okay. name. It's okay. First name I saw. Um, I think he... I mean, Simon Yates could have done a Simon Yates thing already. And, you know, he's suddenly in the break with a tug buddy and just torches everybody on this climb. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't surprise me. But I'm going with Pino. Um, uh, and I don't think, I don't think there's going to be huge gaps. I think Poggy and Jonas, one will attack. They'll be in the wheel. They'll kind of stop a bit. Hinley, O'Connor and co will come back. There'll be a sprint at the end. They'll lose 15, 20 seconds. The Hinleys and O'Connors of this world. And, um, I don't think it's going to be huge gaps. Chico and wins the stage from me for the, from the breakaway. Yeah, it's good for him. <laughs> it, it is good, but I'm also like... They have to make the breakaway on that uphill section at the start, though, for him to be yeah. in the breakaway. Oh, this, uh, they got the team though. Simmons has yeah. got to help. Simmons can help him out. He's good for this role. Yeah, uh, I really think Simmons can be a big help for him there. That's the first rest day where I think uh, we've. There's not. Yeah, there's some GC stages. That there's stuff in the parkour to offer, but um, it might be small gaps at the first rest day, regardless. Um, before stage ten, Benji. Pretty Dome will have gaps, but it won't be outrageous. It's not going to be yeah. three minutes yet, so which is good. I don't like three minutes at the first rest day. And we're heading into the second week. And this is where we do get that bit of a, a second week feeling for the first few stages. Because every single time, the second week has kind of more transitioning stages sometimes. And we see that here with the next stage being Vulcania to Iswar. Uh, we've got a stage that is odd, I would say. It's a literal transition stage, the way you look at it. It's got climbs for the first, like, 90% of the stage, and then it's a descent to the finish line, basically. So there's climbs for breakaways to form. There's nothing at the end of the stage that is hard enough, necessarily, to really make differences for GC. So there's nothing that shouts, GC riders are going to try and keep it together. And it's, like, a tiny bit too hard to control for me, for the Petersons of this world, definitely for the Vanards of this world, who have a GC rider to take care of that they might go in the breakaway instead. So I've got Van Aert in the breakaway, Vanderpool in the breakaway, Pitcock, maybe even Peterson trying, maybe even Alaphilippe trying, Schultz, Wood, Morich. Simmons, Binim Clark, Mohoric. That's a very Fred, good point, actually. Fred Wright. 
Bob Jungles. Zimmerman. Ah, Zimmerman. Ben Turner. Castro. So. Big break. Mm, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. It's going to be a 1v1 battle between Van Aert and Vanderpool until the finish line. I want Ex- it. I just want it. a group will have gone ahead like on stage seven in 2020. Yeah. No, and Fred Moritz. Wright wins this stage. Fred oh. Wright. I was going to go, no, I was going to go Moritz, but after the British national champs, I think he's broken his duck. I'm going Fred Wright. He's got the wit. He's broken the. He's broken yeah. his duck. What yeah. the fuck is that for an expression? <laughs> oh, okay, that. He's gone off explain. the mark. He's, 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 he's finally won a race. He's, time to, he's opened the account. He's Fred flown Wright. past the wicket. Is that also a cricket? Not really. Term? No. I tried. Not I tried. Really. It's the only word I know from cricket, so. Who have you got? Um. Yeah, I don't really believe in Fanat and Vanderpool are going to get out, outplayed by other riders in reality. I don't... Fuck, oh, this is difficult. Fuck it, I'm going to go for Vanderpool for this stage. Because I feel like I have skipped him for a lot of stage where he can fight for the stage win, so I'm going to take him for this one. And uh, that's my take on this one. But it's also... I don't know how many points this specific stage gives when it comes to points, but let's say it's 50 points again, which I, think it's I would 30. expect it to be 30. but. If it is 50, then Van Aert is gaining another bit of points if he is indeed in the breakaway, huh? Exactly. I mean, if you are in the break, I think stage 10. Yeah, it's a, it's a 30 pointer. But still, oh, okay. third on a 30 pointer, third on a 30 point stage gives more points than third in a pure bunch sprint. It gives 22. Really? Yeah, this is a consistency in Hilly. It's all about consistency. So you can take a lot of points. Uh, anyway, stage 11. It's a pure bunch sprint, I think, 180Ks from Clermont Ferrand to Moulin. I'm going with Wellsford uh, to win this stage. I do bit like late, to pick huh? up. Yeah, a bit late. Uh, who have you got? I'm going to go for uh, straight 900 meters. Mm. Is this the Cavendish stage? Oh, true. Yeah. Maybe. Why not? Yeah. No, I'll I'm, wing I'm, it. I'm saving his pick. You're saving him for Bordeaux or? I'm there. Champs Elysees. Fuck off. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go for Jakobsen. Okay. <laughs> Next stage, 170Ks. This is all got, this is going to have the same list of characters as stage 10. It's going to be a breakaway. It's 170Ks. It's got three climbs, like the stage called Brelly Beat Godou on, or Conrad maybe in, in 2021. Like three climbs of about 10 to 15 minutes duration, all over 6% sm- smattered together. No one's going to want to control this stage. Um, it's nailed on breakaway for a Simon Clark, a Morich, a, a Conrad. And, yeah, and yeah. this is the kind of stage where those bonus seconds, those 8-5-2 bonus seconds come on like the Quarosier climb towards the end of the stage. Break breakaway will take those seconds. That's one of those stages. So uh, I'm going for Morich for this one. I feel like it's been a while yeah. since I've seen this man at the front of a, a Tour de France breakaway. So I feel like for nostalgia purposes, get over here. I'm going with Matteo Jorgensen winning this stage. He's got the big engine, and I think he can actually hold... He can go solo on that last climb, and he can hold that for 30 kilometers, no problem. So I'm picking Jorgensen for this stage. Stage 13. This is a as close as you'll get to a La Vuelta Unipuerto. 136 k's from chatillon sur Chalron to Grand Colombier. 70 k's of flat. A warm-up climb of about 45 minutes. Very shallow gradients pretty much before the HC... Grand Colombier, which is 17 kilometers, I think. Yeah, it's pretty long. 17 kilometers at over 7%. Now, the problem is for there being big GC gaps is it levels off at the end. And we saw this in 2020 where Pogacar actually beat Roglic when Jumbo Visma missed time the lead out. So even though the first 7K is at 8%, and then there's actually a 3.4K 9% section, it levels off and there's even rest periods. So I think this is break. This is on Bastille Day. Yeah. Unless UAE chase all day for a poggy stage win, this is break. No. Before you say. Gampino. Gampino, Bastille Day would Who be the. Is French. Will Jean Poussin's French, Barguilla's no, French. But he's no good. Well, I can't find any other good ones. There's not many French riders at this tour, is there? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, the Australians have taken over Raj Desert. With some Belgians around them. Where's, where's all the French riders? <laughs> I don't know, man. They disappeared. <laughs> There's no... What's going on? Well, they're leaving the Mar home in favor of a Dutchman. Let us find them better. So <laughs> that's where French people are going. Yeah, well, Luke picked that team. Um, 
Yeah, I, I want to pick a Madawaz or someone, but they won't let him in the move. Uh, a yeah. Grand Colombian, Madawaz. He's fucking good, isn't he? Uh, I don't... I'm going to go, should... Sh go Sepp Kuz. Sepp Kuz gets in the breakaway like he did in the Vuelta 2019 as a defensive satellite, then all of a sudden realizes there ain't nothing going to happen, and he gets to go for it. Defensive satellite rider on the Grand Pole Colombia stage. I don't know. I, Where a satellite I rider action is impossible. I wanted impossible. to pick a French rider, but they didn't take any. Closest thing to a French rider is Sepkus, <laughs> le Francais. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Okay, yeah. Anyway, anyway you, you, <laughs> you do stage 14. It. Yeah, I will do. I will do stage 14. We've got Juplan stage. I actually kind of like this stage, even though. The end is a descent to the finish line, and sometimes when it comes to descents to the finish line, I'm like, why does it need to be there? And it's a technical it's... one too. Exactly. Anyway, it's very medium mountainy. The first half of the stage has four climbs in it, 4.4 kilometers, 4.6%, the Col de Saxel. Then we've got the Col de Coup, 7.1 at 7.4%, then Col de Feu, 5.9 at 7.7%, then Col de Jean Bast, an easier one, 6.5 at 38 Anyway, that's where brake forms, that's where potential satellite riders go ahead. Then we've got the combination of Ramas Jouplen. This has been in the Tour de France before. I don't remember when, I think 20, uh, 2013, 2016, something like that. It was in there somewhere. A stage Padun that... one on this Dauphiné stage 8, 2021. What's oh, sorry? Padun one on this yeah. is in the Dauphiné. Correct. Beat Vingegaard. Do it again. And I, ba -ba. I think Isagire dropped Nibli in the last ascent in stage 20. Of the 2016 Tour de France, which was really painful. And shut up about Nibali. <laughs> anyway, the shark is close to my heart. We've got a stage that will go to the breakaway, but we'll have GC action, right? Bonus seconds I, on Juplan. No, I think Vingegaard wins this stage. I think, oh. um, I think the CPA are talking about getting rid of the descent, and I think they oh. might do that. And so if it finishes uphill... Then that changes be, things, eh? Yeah, the GC team is going to be even more likely to go for it. So, I mean, these are two very hard climbs. 14k, 7% with steep sections. And the Juplan is really hard. It's over 30 minutes. The Pantani KOM and, and Padun did 34 minutes going very fast. So, it's a serious climb. I think Vingegaard wins the stage and takes good time. I, If it's indeed finishing at the top of Juplan, then it's a 140 kilometer stage, which makes it very... Well, not super easy to control, but easier to control. It's still a, a hard stage to control with all the climbing at the start of the stage. And the D plus Denevel meters, the altitude meters don't necessarily change. And it's still 4,300 in that sense. So yeah. I believe it's also GC then, unless we've got a very strong breakaway, which is possible, but it's, it's harder. So yeah. I but also got... believe that Vingegaard would win if that is the case. I, um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I don't think it's that much easier than how to cam. It's maybe a little bit lower altitude, but it's a pretty hard climb. Steep, yeah. consistently steep too. Uh, stage 15, this is a very, very interesting stage. 180 kilometers from uh, Le Jet to uh, Saint-Gervais-Mont-Blanc, which is actually finished up at Le, uh, Le Betex. It is all medium mountain, all steep, pretty much, over 7%, and so much accumulated climbing like over 4,000 meters Denevelle, with no extended climbs, it's a really hard stage, but you could say, okay, if this comes to a finish, 7K, 7.7%, you know, that's just poggy territory to win the sprint. Mm -hmm. So I, I, mix, I think UAE go for this stage. And also there's Amarond, 2.7K, 10%. Like when are UAE going to use the, the fictitious Adam Yates co-leader that I've created in my head? <laughs> you know, is, it, is this a stage to use it? Where on the Col, Col de la Croix Free, 11.3k, 7%, before up and down, up and down, you, that's where you play numbers. And so I think UAE might try something here. Um, Quick question. Is yeah. this before the rest day? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, day before. Okay, so there is more likelihood that they go for it They'll because for it. there's a rest day before the next time trial that's coming up. So... I also believe that UA will go for it. I'm honestly not sure how Adam Yates can be used as a secondary leader in terms of yeah. attacking style. It early. sounds nice in theory, but you look at the stages and it's actually not. The problem is they can't just get Wout Van Aert in a break. Yep. <laughs> you know, there's no Wout Van Aert waiting on the other side for Adam Yates <laughs> if they do something. Uh, seriously, so like 
Because you look at after Calder's RV, right? Yeah. Imagine you've isolated Vingegaard and you've got Wout van Aert ahead of you to pull Adam Yates and all of a sudden there's a big problem for him. But Jumbo just won't let that happen. They won't let Trenton and, and Malt and Groshartney in the breakaway without themselves being represented. So, yeah, tough to see. Uh, but I think a poggy sprint most likely outcome yep. here. Bogatra wins this stage for me. Stage 16 after the second rest day. I know I've, we've changed from odds and evens from Passy to Combleu. This is 22.4 Ks, an extremely difficult TT, 600 meters Denevelle. I don't know whether teams will use a road bike or a TT bike or change. The Cote de Dormancy is 2.4, 5K is 9.5%, but then it levels off at the end. Uh, I am going to go with Vingegaard winning the TT, Benji, but actually small gaps. I think he beats P P uh, Pogacar by eight seconds. Not sure about Pogacar's wrist action on the on the TT bars yet, but I've got Pogacar for this time trial. I think he's been training more on the TT bike. Okay, I've got Pogacar for this time trial, so we've got a bit of a 1v1 going on for this one, and it's an interesting TT because it's, there's so many aspects to it. Eh? You've got that rolling hills at the start, the flat part in the middle, then the climb at the end, you're right. If they change, it's before the last climb for me. Yeah. It's before the, the final climb, and I'm kind of like, is it long enough to be able to warrant uh, an actual change to a TT bike? I think, I I think there's going to be riders that might do it, but I think there's yeah. also going to be riders that don't do it. So it's, it's interesting. something I would do it fully with the TT bike, but we yeah, say that every honorable. time. 25% Muda Wii, he would do yeah. on a TT bike anyway. Maud Lassar, he would have done it. He would have done anyway, it. Anyway, on to the Queen stage now. We've got on paper the Queen stage, Saint-Gervais Mont Blanc to Courchevel. That's not the name of the, the finishing climb. That's a, a finish with a small descent, but what comes before is, is extraordinary. We've got 5,400 meters of altitude. You've said it at the start, a lot of altitude meters because I've gone through the history here and there's like barely any stage that remotely hit 5,300. Really? So 5.4 is uh, more. It's more than 5,300. We've got three climbs before we get to the final climb. We start with the Col de Saisie. That starts roughly 10k into the stage and it's 13.5 kilometers, 5%. Breakaway formation climb. Cormain de Roselon breakaway formation climb. Maybe again, if it hasn't broken yet nah, on reckon. the first one. But it's 5.9 kilometers, 6.6%. 6 .6%, but that's saying the last part of the climb because there's, there's, it's actually longer. It's like 17 kilometers of climbing roughly, yeah. this, this climb. So Cormain de Roselon, rough Tough. tough of business. Then it's a bit of a valley in between that and the next one, the Côte de, the Côte de Longfoy. We've got 6.7 at 7.5%. And then we've got a 10-ish, uh, five-kilometer valley towards we start the, the big climb. In two parts, right? We've got on paper Côte de coming, but it seems like it's a staircase of two steps. We've got the part to Courchevel itself, 9.2 kilometers at 7%. Then a small bump towards the bottom of Côte de Los. And that does the last portion. In total, we've got 28.3 kilometers of climbing at 6% over those two steps towards the top of Côte de la Lose. Souvenir Henri de Grange, so double points, but I don't care about that at the moment. gc wise, we've got a descent of 6 kilometers towards the finish line after Côte de la Lose. Dangerous I don't too. really care about that descent. I don't know why it's there. They might take it out. Does it matter if they take it out in reality? I don't think so. Like, if you take this out, I mean, like, come on, they're going to be coming a lot, like across in what, like everyone on their own so if yeah. you take this out then it's like well then never put a descent finish in again it is very narrow though it is very narrow this descent apparently but yeah 28 k's of climbing at six percent to 2300 meters with the last 10 k's from maribel to Lowe's at over eight percent with the hellish ramps this is where roglic dropped pagacha but pagacha hung on despite looking bad oh, in 2020 oh, oh. brilliant stage superman lopez won that stage i made a fucking fair bit of cash on that i tell you I think he's at 15s <laughs> on that stage. Um, I think Vingegaard wins the tour here. Um, okay. I think this is, this is yeah. I this think is where he super, needs to do it, eh? Yeah, it's obvious, like super long climb to high altitude. Like this is the closest you're going to get to Grenon, right? Yeah, but the problem for me is, not when it comes to Vingegaard, I believe that this is the moment where Vingegaard needs to try and strike and take hold of the Tour de France. UAE will know that. Like They know that they're yeah, going to go here. One, is this late for Vingegaard to put all legs on the basket of this? I believe he'll already have tried stuff before we get to this stage. Yeah, for sure. You can't Very just pick likely. a week three stage. Exactly. But on UAE side, 
Pogacar is a very active rider. He's going to attack earlier than this. Will Yui be comfortable going with the same time into a stage like this as Vingegaard? I'm not sure. On the same time? Not really, eh? No shot. They will want as big a lead as possible before this. Vaughn 221, so well. he dropped him. Grenon, he dropped him. Altakami dropped him. I know Roglic isn't here, but the longest climbs, like UAE aren't stupid. They're going to be looking at Betex. They're going to be looking at um, other stages, punchy stages, and thinking, <laughs> let's take, let's yep. use Pogacar's sprint. They look at, you know, so yeah, there's no, no way UAE, I think, will play. That's just not how Pogacar rides. So that, it's going to be interesting. Um, yep. Both Jonas will not want to just put all the eggs on this stage, and then Pogacar will want to be aggressive before. So I think it should be an aggressive tour, but up to this, but yeah, I think, uh, I think, um, I think Jonas kills probably yeah, but, in this. Sorry, but I don't see how UAE can use Adam Yates as a, a one to attack in I this tour Adam Yates is so better far. Than on the climbs over 20 minutes. What? Sorry, sorry, repeat. I think Adam Yates is better than Poggy on climbs over 20 minutes. Okay. So that's why on Tourmalet, I'm like, yeah, what are you, are they going to make Yates pace for Poggy? I don't know. So They won't have to, I believe, that's at not, that point. By the way, that's Poggy because he's been injured, and I'm going to get to the full discussion in a second. I, I don't think the injury, I'm very glad. Whoever the surgeon was that did that, I should probably send you a Christmas card because you've made our Tour de France much, much more exciting. By, and Pogacar himself by rehabilitating that wrist. Thank Christ he is here in good shape or whatever shape. So I'm very, very glad he is here and it's going to make it much more exciting, but um, it has to have an effect. Anyway, so who'd you pick? I picked Jonas. I'm also going to go for Jonas on the stage. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's one of those that it's just too hard for a break to win. The break would just die. Like uh, yeah. Stage 18. It starts uh, from Moutier to bourg en bresse 185 kilometers. It's a, sp I was going to say sprint. I think everyone's fucked. I'm going with yeah, the door. The, I'm going with the door from the breakaway. Wait, 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 wait. That's the next one. That's the next one, my friend. Did I skip one? No, I believe that this is going to be the sprint stage. Stage 18. I think they're both. I think the sprint. Dude, after cause of the lows. No offense, but Sam's going to be pretty tired this evening if he makes the time cut. <laughs> <laughs> Fabio's going to be pretty tired. Oh, you may be right at a pace. Why not? I think Philipson takes the stage, and I think we get to stage 19 very fast, nah, you're and that's right. a, you're right. that's a breakaway stage. Pick? Can no. I change my pick? No. I, okay, you can. <laughs> I'm, going with ben, I'm going with Benny for stage 18. Because he, he will be the most surviving sprinter after Cola Lose, yeah, or what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Benny, stage 19. Whereas the next stage, it's, the sprinter's going to say, oh, it's uphill, and there's hills in the first 50Ks. Fuck it. Fuck. Yeah. Niels, Niels, you can get in the break. I kind of want to change my pick to Bauhaus, but I'm not sure if he's still be in the race at this point. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Lowe's is pretty hard. Um, it is pretty hard. Anyway, stage 19 from uh, Moran Montagne to Poligny. It is a, it's got a, it's a nailed on transition stage. Who did I pick before? Oh, yeah, I'm going with, um, this is Morich, Terry. I'm going with Morich. This is like what he's, this is what he does. I kind of want to go for Madawas, even though it's relatively Ooh. easy terrain for Madawas. Nah, it's, a nice, it's a nice stage for him. Okay, I'm going to go for Madawas. I'm, I feel sad that I haven't picked Von Hills yet. It just doesn't I have want... a punchy finish. If this had a yeah. 2k 8% finish, you'd pick him, right? Is Von Hills the Trumale stage winner that we don't see yet? Nah, I think, I think it's a little bit too difficult. I don't know. I'd like to see him try. Who'd you, who'd you <laughs> pick for this? I took Morich. I don't remember who I picked, so let the comments decide who I picked. I forgot about it. Let's go to the next Benji stage. Benji picked Vanderpool. No, I did not. I did not pick Vanderpool. Dude, I that's disagree. a good pick. You should take that pick. I'll pick Vanderpool. <laughs> Fuck. It's a, good, it's a good stage for him. <laughs> I really forgot who I picked, actually. But stage 20, Belfort to Le Markstein. This is indeed that not full copy-paste, but a, a similar stage to the one we had in the Tour de France from last year as one of the decisive stages towards the end of that. Uh, Sure. We've got medium mountain happiness throughout, but is it good enough to be a raid stage? So let me go through it. It's 133 kilometers, so it's fucking short. It's tiny, yeah, very but it's short. very difficult. Cold Alsa, no, Ballon d'Alsace, very different name. 11.5 kilometers, 5.3%. Small valley until we reach the next few climbs, which is 
This is a really weird next 40 kilometers. We've got six, no, 5.2 kilometers at 7.1%, slight downhill, then 3.2 kilometers, 7.9%, then a bit of a, a plateau section towards the next climb, 4.2 kilometers, 5.1%. It's like it's a, a climb that is kind of like, what do you use to, to cut planks of wood? A saw. It looks a like an, a reverse, an inverse saw. Sawtooth. It looks like saw teeth. A saw teeth yeah. climb. Yeah. There we go. We've got a new definition right here. Anyway, we're still only halfway to stage. Descend to the next climb, the second last climb, Petit Ballon, 9.3k, 8.1%. Then Col du Plazzo, Wassel afterwards, 7.1 kilometers at 8.3%. Then a, a seven kilometer flat section on top of Plazzo, Wassel to the line. About yeah. this. Is it hard enough to do satellite rider work here? Because, like, the satellite rider work, if you no. attack on Petit Ballon, you only have a descent where a satellite rider can help, and maybe... Because, yeah. like, then you're going to drop your satellite rider on the Platzer Russell the last climb, so he's not useful on the flat section at the end. Well, you need them right at the end for the last 7Ks. Yeah, but then I feel like they'll wait until Platzer Russell to make their move in the first place. Yeah, and then you've not got... How much gap are you going to take? So, I think it's breakaway. I, I'm tossing and turning between Danny Martinez and Carapaz. Um, Ooh, I'm, going Carapaz. With, I'm going with Carapaz. I think he's uh, fallen out of GC, and I think he'll be maybe maybe he's in eighth or something, and he's just it's such a hard start that no one can stop him getting in the break, and I think he wins okay. the stage, Carapaz. But I, I would go with Martinez. But yeah, Carapaz. It is very likely it's going to be a GC rider, like you say, that has fallen out of GC and has to go for stage ones like a cut up pass, like a Salmon Yates, maybe in Ciccone. Adam Yates. No, <laughs> you don't like that. But um, no, Ciccone. Don't joke about Adam Yates. <laughs> or is it ah, Sean Poussin? No, no, this is a, this is a hard stage. <laughs> You're not going to well, pick one of your Uno you know, X boys? Fuck no. For you haven't this picked stage. one of them. Well, they're not going to win a stage, in my opinion. So You don't think THJ can win this? No. All right. Who are you going with? I'm going for Pogacar with a 90 kilometer rate to try and win the Tour de France last minute. <laughs> Fuck yes, he's doing it. He tried that last year, it didn't work. Uh, he's um, going to try it again and it's going to work. Pogacar's <laughs> <laughs> take a Langen on the plateau, <laughs> <laughs> pulling in the glory. Um, okay. Uh, final stage, Champs Elysees sprint. I'm going with Cavendish. Obviously, anyone that picks anything else is a hater. Who have you got? Philipson. Yeah, I mean, that's a good pick. Uh, but yeah, Cav will, Cav will do it and break the record. Um, Eddie Merckx will actually be on the line trying to throw rocks at him to stop him crossing the line in first. Anyway, there are all the stages and our predictions. I'm sure one of our helpful listeners will put a, the spreadsheet together as normal or all our picks. Uh, usually, we're 100% accurate. Anyway, let's start with white jersey. Benji, the easiest one. Uh, there's not much to discuss. Pogac is the clear favorite and he should win it. He's still eligible, I believe. I hope he so. He's eligible. He's eligible. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, your pick would be I stupid, check. but I agree. Yeah. I think he's eligible indeed. I'm also going to go for Tadej Pogacar. Just wanted to tell you that. But <laughs> anyway. KOM. KOM. So. The, Woods Pino? Yeah, well, we think it's going to be Woods Pino. Geshka's back. Kofidis will try and someone. Geshka's not had the shape. Remember last year he was going for it. He actually came through. Third in Romandie in GC. Yeah. He's not had that shape this year. Ciccone is my pick for KOM. Ooh, um, I yeah, like you that. like that. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Did he, has he won it in another race or is that another Italian? I think he's won KOMs before, yes. Yeah. So let me see. Is he, he won it in the Giro. He's winning it. Yeah. Fuck. You pick Pino. I'm going to pick Pino. Uh, is there I anything just to add a, a bit more analysis to it? Like any points we think are really uh, obviously stage 17, you, you have to be in the break because there's two yeah. cat ones. So even if you don't make it to Col de la Lowe's finish, you have to be in that break. Also, stage 15 is sneaky important. It has three category ones too. Saint Gervais Le, Le Betex finish has three cat ones. So there's so many points. In stage 14, with three Cat 1s and an HC, stage 15 and stage 17, that I, I'm really, because I don't think Brake will take it on Puy de Dome. I think that's GC, boys. It, what will turn it, I think, because the GC riders have won it a lot, <laughs> too many times, 
is first of all the Col de Soudé on stage five. If you're Chicone and you really want KOM and to maybe win that stage, you must be in mm-hmm. that break. It's an HC climb on stage five, and the break will for sure cross first. Yep. And then on Tourmalet, if that goes to the break with two Cat 1s and an HC, then we might see a non-GC rider winning this thing, which I would like to see personally. Um, and I think Chicone and Pino, hopefully they will get in that, those two breakaways on five and six. They're crucial too if you're targeting this. It depends on how much time they lose in the first four days and if they no. want to go for pride. KOM. Yeah, it's their pride that will Guys change Guys are that. too proud to lose time on purpose. They need to lose time 100% if they want it. And yeah. there's enough opportunities for breakaways to win stages that KOM will go to a breakaway rider if he's consistent enough to go in those breakaways and if he starts early with his quest to do so. Yeah. So It's not like Denmark last year where like court is nice. He was in KOM for five days, yeah. but it didn't matter. The, there's important stages in week one where you need to accumulate points on Cat 1s and HC. Green jersey, Benji. Yes, green jersey. There's Philipson as one of the one of the named favorites as one of the riders that said he was going for it, for example. Then you've got Wout van Aert on the opposite end who doesn't want to go for it, according to what he's saying, but will indirectly still take points by wanting to win stages, by being in breakaways as support for Jonas Vingegaard. And like, when it comes to Philipson, it's going to be much harder than last year's Tour de France for him. That was a focus on stages. He could pick out his stages and go for them, rest on all the other stages. Now he's going to have to actively go in breakaways on stages yeah. that aren't necessarily his thing. So, for example, there He literally has to mark Van, uh, Van Aert jumping yeah. in break formation himself. Not every single one. Like, no. There are stages where it's unrealistic for him to take those points where Van Aert yeah. is going to take the points if he goes for it. Seven potential sprint stages, that's where he sprints. One versatile sprint stage, stage eight, that's where he goes for the, for the actual finish, I would think, to also gain points. But then... He needs to try and enter in stage 5, I think, stage 9, 10, 13, and 15. Those are the kind of stages where the first half has a, an intermediate sprint that is reachable and realistic for him to take points if he's got someone with him, a supportive rider in his team, maybe a Vanderpool, maybe a certain Anderson, that can help him be tugged by the and be in that breakaway and then try and out sprint Wout van Aert for that intermediate sprint. That's where he can do that. But there's also some of them where he just doesn't need to be in the breakaway. Last week, he's all about survival. Don't go in breakaways at that point unless it's absolutely necessary to win green. Because otherwise, you risk just being dead. Yeah, and I think there's going to be a situation where Vanderpool refuses to ride with Van Aert because Philipson's behind in green or in the green competition. Mm-hmm. That actually might be a strategic advantage for Vanderpool to have that plausible deniability in this race. Because usually they just work together. Um, Paris Bay, we didn't get to see what would have happened after the last uh, Confin Pavel with Philipson behind. But yeah, how do you see Binny and Pedersen? They're my two on the next list of versatile sprinters. Do you, I think their consistency in the big bunch sprints is my question mark. Yeah. In that Philipson and Van Aert both have better last men. Kirsch is good, but Laporte and um, Van der Poel are better. So I think it's going to be difficult for those two. Binny's sprint really impressed me in Swiss. Yeah. Really, really impressed me. And uh, he's my pick actually for green. Because I think really? Philipson, I think Binny climbs, I think this is just such a hard parkour. I and, don't trust um, his positioning. Tree, I know, yeah. His positioning in the pure bunch sprints is the big problem, but he's got Petit, he's got Turnison, he's got, um, I mean, it's kind of a meme pick because I'm kind of be a bit different, but I think B- I'd see Binny above Pedersen. Yep. And it's also because Pedersen kind of disappointed in the Ciclamino for me. Yeah, like, and he went home and what's his shape going to be like? Okay, so you got Phillips and I got Binny. We'll move to I GC. I got Philipson, but it won't be as easy as people pretending. No, or I don't think it's, it's not a walk. Yeah, because Van Aert also will be in contention even if he yeah. doesn't want to be in contention. Yeah. But on to the big one. The podium steps. Who do you think will be third, second, and oh, first let's talk, in this let's, let's, talk, let's talk a bit more uh, overview. Let's talk about all the stages. Ta- let's talk yeah. a bit of tactics. People like us to actually talk about now. We've discussed all the stages, what the key points are. So yeah. for me, Pagacha is kind of like his, what he was doing. I think he's going to do what he did last year. They're going to set him up for stages he can win. 
He mm-hmm. likes winning stages. You get bonus seconds when you win stages. There's these extra bonus gates with eight seconds for him to sprint. Yep. I think he's going to try hoover up as many bonus seconds as possible. Yep. I think he really backs himself in the TT. And after the Slovenian national champs, why wouldn't he? And maybe Vingegaard's TT might not be as good. So I think he'll back himself in the TT. And I think he'll wait for a mistake. I think he'll try and make Jonas panic. He'll wait for a crash, which happened on yep. stage 15 last year. It nearly happened on the descent of Spandell. It nearly happened in the TT. And I think it'll bite his time. Borgi on Spandell as well. Yeah, true, true. Um, that's fair enough. But I'm just thinking, he... Yeah. And I think he'll wait for a mistake and try to pounce to take real time. I, I can't point to anywhere on this parkour where I can confidently say Poggy will take real time on Jonas there. I don't think there is a stage. I think so as well. It needs to be a benefit of something happening, a situation, an incident happening, something to Vingegaard or with Vingegaard that Pogacar can take benefit of. That's the only option I see because otherwise it is hoovering up sprints, hoovering up bonus seconds and so forth and defending that, defending that point towards the Which actual... Which is good strategically. Being in yellow, even by 20 seconds, it means you're yeah. in the wheel. Yeah. And... I won't lie, with Cold La Laws, it's also a stage where, yes, it's hard before Cold La Laws, 100%. The altitude meters are there, 100%. But it's also not possible for Yambo to, to pull him out of its cage early on that stage. It's going to be a Cold La Laws 1v1 in the end. And, well, unless <laughs> Yates arrives. <laughs> but but um, they dropped him on Aldercam with Kus and Van Aert last year. Why couldn't they drop him on Lowe's with Kelderman, Kus and Van Aert? Well... It is always possible, but he you would want to hold. Out to cam. But let's let's fucking be honest. Eh? If Pogacar can't follow Vingo on those climbs, he can't win this Tour de France. So uh, if he wants to win the Tour de France, he needs to do it there. So you and I agree because how much bonus can he take realistically, maximum? Because for all the eight seconds he's taking, Jonas is taking five. Yeah. Um, now maybe on stage one and two, he might take the full ten second delta. Yeah. Where Jonas, eh, so let's say half I, a minute. Half a minute, yeah, I was going to say half a minute is like the max realistically you could take in bonies, maybe 35 seconds. And that was before Granon last year, he was on 35, 40 seconds ahead of uh, Vingegaard. Um, and then Vingegaard put four minutes into him in the, the next week and a half um, and then gave some back on Shams Elise, so it looks closer. So that's what I think Pigatch will do. That's why I said, to me, that's not a great plan. Really? Like, I don't think that's a great plan to just take bonies and then hope something bad happens to Jonas. And that's where we get into rattle the cage of Jonas. And that's where I'm like, Yates, like, to me, it makes more sense to use Yates. I don't know the stage. I don't know the moment. Yeah. Some moment where if Kelderman's had a problem, if Koos is no good after the Giro, you've got 70 kilometers of Jonas all to yourself with Micah and Yates with you and Yates is close on GC. Um, that's where you actually try to take an advantage because I don't think just hoping Jonas crashes or gets COVID and isn't good on long climbs with a 30 second lead from Bonies is the best strategy you could have. Yeah, but we look at can, can we even take Paranese in consideration knowing that Vingegaard just wasn't great there? Because like Paranese a myth, a myth, <laughs> it didn't happen or what? It just, it's just irrelevant. Dava Gudu doesn't think so, but it's just irrelevant. Because like we're getting to the Tour de France and yes, we saw Dauphiné, but we haven't seen Pogacar recently. And I'm kind of like, yes, that, that wrist injury existed. So he might be impacted by that. It looks like he's okay training right now. He's okay racing nationals and yeah. so forth, but we haven't seen it against top competition. I just hope that he's fucking competitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping so. But I, and I think he's going to be firing on week one. But he, how could he be? Even if he was a bet, and my perspective is even if he's the best version of himself, Paul de Lolo's is going to be difficult. Even yeah. if he's the best version of himself. Um, so that's why the, the, the wrist is a. I'm not sure about the, that on the long stages. But anyway, for Yumbo, they are. Yeah, probably going to concede some seconds to Pogacar in week one, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 
on the longer climbs. We'll see. We'll see what uh, Jonas can do. I mean, are we erasing? Like, I really, I know Hindley and the G won the Giro out of nowhere, but like, if Jonas and Poggy are in good shape, I really don't see how anyone can hang with them on on Juplan. Like, yep, I agree. Yeah, um, if they're both in good shape and they they clash at their best, then it's a fight for the podium for the others if they don't fall off their bike and so forth, yeah. which can happen, but I'm looking at an interesting fight for the podium, though. They're like, fight spot is open. I like yeah. Hindley for it, though, but it's very interesting. I agree with your assessment when it comes to Pinga being inherently the better pure climber over Pogacar, with Pogacar being the the more versatile rider, but that has diminished over Vingegaard because Vingegaard's gotten better when it comes to medium mountains, when it comes to hilly terrain. And you've got that percentage of Pogacar that we're not sure about when it comes to his wrist injury. So I um Do you think Yumbo have enough climbing support? Because that's been I've seen some people react. I think it's enough. I think it's enough as well because it's it's if not Kuz worse than UAE. Good. So yeah. like if yeah, if Gus has has good form after doing the Giro. If Kelderman's looking good, yeah. like for example, in, if he's as good as in Swiss when he comes to the mountains, then he can domestique. If Fanat is, even even if he's 95% of what he was last yeah. year, he's still good mountain support. And with the rest of the team, they can be medium mountain support. It's not like UAE has much better support than Yumbo has when he comes to mountains. I think they're fairly equal outside of the fact that they just don't have a secondary leader at Yumbo Visma this time around. And if I, when I saw this parkour the first time around with Pogacar in full force, I would have been way more confident than I am after not having seen him for a while. Because mm. like it's, it's tough to know, yeah. Because Slovenian national champs, it's good. He's back. He's racing, but it, you know, yeah, but it's it, not. It's relevant. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. It's how do you perform after fatigue? Like, so uh, we haven't really spoken about the other teams and their strategies. Honestly, I think it's following. And I think there's going to be a race yep. behind, a race within the race, kind of like last year. If, if you know, Jonas and Poggy are not crashed out or anything like that, God forbid. So I think there'll be like a Dauphiné, a race behind between the likes of Landa, Carapaz, Mars, O'Connor, Godou, Hindley. Hindley. Um, I think that's what will happen. And I think it'll be mano a mano a lot of the time, uh, just like it was between Vlasov, Quintana, and, yep. and Godou and Thomas last year. I don't... Um, I see Yates as Geraint Thomas. I see I see the two, a step, Yates, another step uh, below him. Yeah. But whether he has to blow himself up for Poggy, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, I think it'll be a good battle. I think it's going to be aggressive. My podium is third, uh, Jai Hindley. Fuck off. Second, Adam Yates. First, Jonas. You're... you're... Pogacar doesn't exist. I think he's going to struggle. I think he's okay. going to struggle. I'm going to go the complete opposite way, and you, you could have expected this, to be honest. I've got Henley and Ferd. Not in first. Oh, I was going to say first. Henley and Ferd. But then I've got, I've got Jonas in second. I've got Pogacar in first. And the reasoning is that I just trust Pogacar more in terms of being able to stay on the bike, being able to be averse when it comes to accidents, and it's paid off a few Tour de France when I've said that, so I'm going to stick with my guns. Yes, last year didn't pay off, but this year is going to pay off again, even though I agree that Vingo is inherently the better climber over Pogacar. Pogacar's the better racer. Pogacar's the better racer. More he, calm. I trust him more to be able to make wise decisions on the road when something happens in a split second, and I just have a, a feeling that something will happen somewhere. I hope it's nothing bad, but yeah. True. I mean, Jonas is pretty easy to make panic from last year, stage five of the cobble stage, or crashing himself on descents twice when he'd already had the Tour de France wrapped up, or crashing in Carcassonne. He's yeah. he seems pretty flappable. So maybe he's calmer now. He's actually won yellow, but uh, I guess to explain why I don't think Pogacar will be on the podium, it's just I think uh, I think he is at such a disadvantage in terms of. Fatigue resistance and in his preparation. I don't I have I don't know what his preparation's been, but I'm just assuming it and that Hindley and O'Connor, mainly Hindley, who's won the Giro, they have such an advantage. They've prepared all year for this without problems. Hindley's come into shape well. I think Yates is looking very good, and I think uh, I don't think UAE will tell Yates to wait for him. And then Pagacha is the sort of guy that doesn't give a fuck about fighting for third. And so 
if he can be like, how about I go win four stages in week three or week two and KOM? Yeah, but I think he'll do all, that. That's also the reason that I find it fun to take Pogacar as my pick for this race. Because like I said on stage 20, even if he's on three minutes, he'll he's going to attack win. or try and attack on the first yeah. or second climb of the day. 90k solo. He's not afraid to try it if he's on three minutes anyway. He's won the bloody Tour de France before. Maybe the team wants him to get a podium spot for UCI points, but please, Pogacar, don't you dare fucking listen to that. Go for the victory, all or nothing, and Can I, I just want my something pick? heroic. Oh, no, I'm sticking with my guns. I'm sticking with my guns. Like, <laughs> what was course, the change you'd make? I would have, I would have put Pogacar in third, but um, okay. no, I'm sticking with Hin yeah, Hindley third, Yates second, um, Jonas first. I think Pogacar will be hyper-aggressive. Uh, and it will cost him because he doesn't give a fuck about coming third because I think, he's Pogacar. I think hyper aggressive Pogacar will cost Adam Yates. Yeah, true. Or Hindley too. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, swings and roundabouts. But yeah, that's how I, how I see the race. But let us know how you see how you see the race. It's obviously been a long episode, but we've cranked it out early thanks to our uh, poor producer Luke, who has to put this two hour beast uh, together. But I've really enjoyed doing it. I'm hyped for the tour as a reminder for housekeeping. We will be live streaming watch alongs for stage one, two, five, and nine in week one together here in Andorra. We're going to see pretty quickly whether our picks are correct or, or our assessments <laughs> of form are correct. Um, and yeah, if you, if you want to support the podcast and help us do things like that, the Ko-Fi link is down below, as I said, to directly uh, to support us. But otherwise, unless there's some emergency news or team announcements, I can't imagine what it would be. We will see you on Saturday afternoon with the recap of Stage 1 of the Tour. Until then, ciao.